meeting. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started, and I know we have a couple other people that will be joining us, commissioners. Um, so the first order of business is um, the approval of the March 14 minutes. So if everyone's had a chance to look at those, do we have a motion? I will move that we approve the uh, March minutes. Do we have a second? A second. Great. And uh, everyone in favor? Aye. Okay, it passes. Great. So now we come to the part of the meeting that is an no, open. Wait. Yeah. Say abstain. yeah. Oh, abstain because she wasn't there. Okay. So we still have enough. That's right. Um, so now we're at the part of the meeting, which is an open public comment section. So this is for any items that are not on the agenda later in the meeting. If you have comments about items on the agenda, those will there will be a comment opportunity there. But if you have a general comment that's not about items on the agenda, um, you're welcome to come up. And we will be using a, um, a three-minute time limit just to keep the meeting efficient uh, this evening. So uh, feel free to approach the podium if you'd like to make a general public comment. Uh, Shirley Jowell, I'm Vice President of Friends of Five Creeks. Good evening. And I'm going to read you a letter that uh, we drafted. As you know from our April 9 letter, firefighting wetting agents from a garbage truck fire on April 3 in Berkeley appears to have wiped out the f all the fish in Codonesis Creek from Albina more than a mile downstream. Whatever ongoing investigations show, the creek from San Pablo to the railroad tracks will either become a valuable and educational natural amenity, or if we do nothing, it could become a weedy, unattractive mess. We hoped for increased care and a voice for stakeholders from the maintenance found fund that now holds $450,000 that Albany, Berkeley, and UC Berkeley all forgot for years. To try to make up for the backlog from years of neglect, we have focused our volunteer efforts on this strip with six work parties from March to May. But we can't do it alone. Albany needs to do basic spring mowing and control the hedge bindweed vines that, clo that cloak most of the creek each year. We were concerned to see in Monday's City Council agenda that your work plan through 2021 includes nothing about Codonesis Creek. We hope this can be remedied. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any other public comments from the audience related to things not on the agenda for this evening? Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and move forward into the next item, which is announcements from staff or commission members. Took me to go. I'll start. Mine is a quick announcement about the Memorial Park bathroom renovation, which uh, has been a long time since uh, you guys approved it to construction. Uh, but the good news is, is that they've started, they've almost completed the demo of the inside of the bathrooms, and they expect that project to be done in about five weeks. And so that's pretty exciting for uh, users of Memorial Park and the restroom. That's it. And I'll just share that we shared our commission recommendations and staff recommendations with the Sugar Sweetened Beverage Group on the first, and I believe the timing of that is that the city council and city staff are doing some additional research and will bring back to the city council in May um, an updated list of recommendations, but there was very positive and favorable responses to the recommendations made by this commission group and the staff. And I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I watched it online and I thought you uh, spoke well for our um, opinions and uh, initiatives. Thank you. I just wanted to mention uh, a number of us had the pleasure of attending the opening of the Albany Loop sculpture at the Portland and, and uh, Masonic. And uh, I will say I've, I've walked by the sculpture a number of times since then and every time there have been kids playing on that sculpture. I think it's much better than I would have imagined. That's fabulous. Great. Okay, so then we're going to jump to our um, first presentation, which is about the Memorial Park Path Lighting, um, and we're very excited to have Tiffany Kane with us to present about it. 
And I'll jump in before Tiffany starts. You all have a staff report that was just kind of a brief update of how we got to this point. Uh, Memorial Park lighting was included in the Memorial Park improvements that were funded by Measure WW, and that's the bathroom re renovation and the tot lot expansion, and those two are Tot lot is done, bathroom is almost completed. Uh, due to construction costs, uh, most of that Measure WW money is being used by, been used or will be used by those two projects. Uh, the path lighting was an additional uh, item and it came out of uh, public comment and uh, information uh, from people in the park dropping their kids off at childcare or using the park at night that it's very dark, especially during the uh, winter hours. And so this was really an effort to put a little bit of lighting in the park. Um, as I noted in the staff report tonight, we'll be talking about different types of light options and the direction you want to go with that, and that this project would end up being funded basically by the Recreation Reserve uh, budget. And so with that, Tiffany Kane. Okay, I'll try not to choke. <laughs> it's been a while. Anyway, good evening. Nice to meet you. Um, as Shelley said, I was called about the, the park. I have actually been to the park at night. And the area going into the child care center and around where the play structure is, is very, very dark. You do get some lighting from the street lights at the front area of the park. I had a, a light meter. I was getting readings of anywhere from 3 tenths to 7 tenths of a foot candle, which is okay for general lighting, but it only goes so far. So the options that we were looking at for lighting, there, there are a couple different options. We could go with the low bollard lighting, or we could go with the light poles. Now with the bollard lighting, the pluses to that are that you do get the footpath lighting. The lighting is low. It's not real visual to the neighborhood around, which is a big concern, obviously, because you're just surrounded by homes. Um, the minus to the bollards is that when people are walking through, you don't have the high level lighting, so you can't identify people as well when you're walking through. With the poles, you will get the, the foot candle lighting that you need to get through. You'll be able to identify people. Uh, but no matter how cautious we are about what types of light poles that we put in, neighbors are going to see light out there, and it, it'll be perceived light. So there are ways to control that, for example, using a house side shield so along one street they can't see anything. They're going to see it from the other side but it's further away. Um, also, the lights would be turned on with the photo cell, like the street lights are, and then they would be shut off at night by a time clock. Let's say, hypothetically, you have the time clock set for 10 o'clock at night. You get calls from the neighbors, and they say, you know, 10 o'clock, the lights are still on, it's inviting people to come in and use the park at night, and this is really an issue. What can we do about this? Set it for 9 o'clock, set it for 8.30. And then you can also, with the light poles, light more of the park, and which would be good for your music festival or any other functions in the evening. And there again, you can set the time clock to stay on later for functions like that. Um, <clears throat> all of the fixtures that are presented in your package are dark sky compliant. So they don't shed light up to the sky, which is something that most, most municipalities are looking for now, and I'm sure that your, yours is as well. Um, it also helps keep light throw in, into the neighborhoods. Um, we also discussed a little bit about a little bit of uplighting for the three redwood trees. Apparently, a number of years back, there was uplighting, and it's very beautiful. I've also put in the package an option for a light, which would be recessed into the ground, which can't be kicked over and, and broken by kids running through the park or, or anyone else. Um, so when we get into this, We went ahead and we took a couple pictures of your park. Unfortunately, we had the green fencing for your restroom project back there, but we threw in a couple of bollards. <laughs> Not that it's bad that the bathrooms are getting redone. Um, with, with the bollard look um, and then with the light pole look, just to give you a visual idea to help you conceptualize what these, these options would look like. Um, so currently, this is the light fixture that you have in the four poles in front of the Veterans Hall, and we can match this fixture. 
Another option is a guard cove fixture, which is a very nice fixture, um, which gives about the same amount of lighting. Uh, as you will see in your budgetary costs, it's also more expensive, um, but it is a very good fixture. Another option, if you wanted to go with, with a different style, is this Tuscany style fixture. This does have a cutoff shield, so it does not shoot light out, so it does meet the dark sky compliance. Um, for bollards, we, we have a, a guard co bollard. I do a lot of K through 12 school work. When we do use bollards on schools, this is a good one because it's very durable. This is another bollard by the same manufacturer that makes the, the light pole that you have in front of the Veterans Center. Again, this is another very good fixture. Has excellent lighting distribution, but is also substantially cheaper than the guard co poles because I know that the budget on this is very tight and we want to get the most we can for your money. Um, and here's the up light. So in looking at the costs, right, I guess I should. And Tiffany, I, if I can interrupt, um, we had a conversation about that last um, light that could be a bollard that looks like mm -hmm. the existing, and it, we did it late in the day. Um, we we so they, it in this afternoon. I apologize. I didn't provide you with the updated cost sheet, so if, if you could actually just highlight that because they don't have that information. Happy to. Thank you. Um, so looking at the various polls, if we went with a poll to match, all right, well, I can't read that very well either, so where's my little cost <laughs> sheet here? If we go with the Econo light pole, which matches what you have on the site now, we would need five poles to get a good foot candle level. And the cost with poles, additional conduit, cabling, et cetera, would be about $19,200. If we did the comparable Guard Co pole, that cost would be about uh, closer to $23,000. If we went with the Tuscany pole, which was the lantern style pole, we would actually need an additional pole to get uh, to match the lighting levels with the others, um, and that is would cost approximately twenty-five thousand. Um, also, I want to stress that these are engineering estimates. This doesn't include contractor markup and, and items like that. If we went ahead with the bollards, the Guardco bollards, um, we would need eleven because they are lower to the ground. Our cost there would be close to twenty-seven thousand. If we went with the Econo light bollards, which match um, similarly the, what you have on site now, the cost for those 11 bollards would be about 20,000. 28. 20,000. 20. Yeah, just under 20,000. And Shelly can give you an updated cost sheet in that, that cut sheet mm -hmm. after so you can look at it. So in looking at, oops, wrong button. Now, the, these are hard to read. The, these are the photometric studies, and uh, unfortunately, you can't read them very well. But what I attempted to do was show that with the poles, if you look where on your little sheets where you have just a dot without a number, there's absolutely no light reading. But you can see with the poles, this entire area is getting some amount of light distribution. And the focus is on the pathways where we're ranging anywhere from three tenths to two foot candles, which is about what we want for some good pathway lighting. Um, and then with the Tuscany poles, you can see in here, they don't throw quite as much light around, but they do get the, the good lighting in the pathway. And again, this is just a big blob on the screen. Now, <laughs> getting into the bollards, you can see the difference here. This entire area that I'm circling, there's absolutely no light throw. And the same thing through here. So that's where the cutoff comes in with the bollards. So you're not getting the wide lighting distribution like you get with, with the poles. And, um, and then this was with the Econo light poles, and this actually Hard to tell on here, but these actually throw a little bit more light out widthwise than, than the other poles, which, and these are, this would be the, the less expensive option for, for the bollards. So it's really a question of 
how do you want to light and how do you want to make use of the light um, and, and thinking about what, what to do with the neighbors. If you really want to utilize the light for other options, you're in, in the, the least expensive scenario, the Econolite bollards or the Econolite poles, the cost is just about the same. So it's really a question of how much light do you want to do? And then obviously if you go with poles, addressing the issues with the neighbors and, and you know, shut off of the lights. And um, I sent it to you late. I got it late as well with a comment from the neighbor. And just so you know, I, we did a uh, postcard drop at all the neighbors that surround the park and, and invited their comments. So we did receive one comment. And we did some additional outreach to those neighbors through our e-notification. So um, we did receive the one comment that you got late. And I printed it for you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Is there more? No, I'm sorry. I guess so, that, that's it. So okay, perfect. Questions. Yeah. So, do do any commissioners have questions for our presenter? I have I have one actually. Mm -hmm. um, are there any nearby parks that you're aware of where I might go at night to see the difference between the light of a bollard or a light of a pole, just to give my because the images are really helpful visually in the daytime for right. me to see like how does it how do I feel about it visually, but in terms of the light differential. Um, I think you have a nearby park by, don't you, that has the, the lantern style poles? Ocean View has Ocean lantern, View? yes. Okay, yes. and I haven't been there. I, I'm not, I, I, I'm familiar with this area in the daytime, but, but at night I'm, I'm really not. But that's definitely something that I could look at and, and give a few options to go see. And in Memorial Park, the four poles, which are the old existing poles, are near where the park, uh, where the stage is. If you wanted to go by at night to see how those are, how bright they are, yeah, yeah. And keep in mind those four poles. You have vo four that are very close together. So when you walk up, it's boom. It's it's a, a big blast of light. Whereas with the other poles, they they would be separated. Um, so it wouldn't be quite so. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. What struck me in the image that you had created was that there were fewer so many fewer poles than bollards that like actually it was less visually arresting. The pole, even though I understand it, you know, it's bigger, it, it right. just, there are so many fewer of them. Right. Because it doesn't take as many to make the light, so. Exactly. Any other questions from this group? Yeah, I guess that's a similar question. I got a kind of an answer that we could look at poles at Ocean View, is that right? Mm -hmm. But what about the bollards? <sighs> Nearby bollards, I would have to look into that for something in the immediate area. Um, if you wanted to drive to Pleasant Hill to Diablo Valley College, I have a project I did there. We did an ADA pathway lighting with, with bollards that are actually these Guardco bollards that I had, had listed up here. But that's, that's about a 25 minute drive for you. So are, are you, so and then I'm kind of understanding that many Parks around here use poles rather than bollards. Is that right? They use both. It, okay. it, again, it's just just the the function and what what do you want to use the lighting for? Um, aesthetics, neighborhood. It's just I you you see really see both. You see both. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just this is a question for the commission. Maybe we talk about it in the discussion. I just I'm, I'm thinking like what is our goal here for this lighting? And I'm just wondering. You know, we have music in the park, yes, but we don't mm -hmm. have that many evening mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. at Memorial Park. So I just, I don't know, Shelley, if you remember or, you know, obviously we need more lighting, mm -hmm. but what's the goal of that lighting? Do you have any sense? Well, that's what you get to decide. But originally it was pathway lighting to make sure that people could get, most of the people who pick up their children are using the path on the uh, Carmel side of the park to get to the facility and the restrooms, and, or from uh, closer by the picnic area, there's a pathway back there. Uh, so that's what, how it originally came up. Um, I, I do want to point out just like two other things is that with the, we could do a mix of bollards, is that? We, we could do those? a mix of poles and bollards, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and would bollards, I think would both function, would both kinds of lighting options serve the function of the lighting path for the, the yes, okay. yeah. You, yeah. You, you would have that function covered either way. Okay. The only other thing that uh, maybe you can answer this is that, that along that pathway are the three large redwood trees, and I think two or three of the poles are in that area. Um, 
and so there is like a blockage from those trees hang down uh, fairly low that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of the light wouldn't just be shining in those neighbors on Carmel. They, they would block quite yeah. a bit, yes. Right. They're very dense. Um, and in, in terms of your, your question, it's a very good point about what do you want the function to be. Um, if you can go with bollards or poles for the same cost, if you can find a happy medium with, with the neighbors in terms of times of shutoff, then you, you have more function with the lighting if you go with the poles to do other things. But of course, like, like you said, that neighbors is a very big consideration, um, so. And if I may, uh, Shelley, was there a lot of issues with neighbors with when the lights were put in um, by the stage, or were those pre-existing? Those been there a very long time? Were they those have been there for a long time. Oh, so really, yeah. we, you wouldn't know if there's a, okay. Yeah, they were there uh, when, as part of the vet, uh, the veterans building. Their style has changed over the years. Sure. Uh, most recently, they used to be a big ball, but um, the, the the outside uh, ball kept getting uh, broken by balls and things being thrown at it. <laughs> uh, and so they have changed this this other version, which is one of the options. So you're not getting complaints about light. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's a ways further mm -hmm. away, I know, than the other. I was just curious. It's true. If you'd heard anything. The park has a lot of light yeah. because there's tennis courts that are on up until closure, um, and then there are street lights around yeah. the area. But yeah. it's very just very dark on this end of the park. I think in terms of distance, like like you just brought up, those four poles are further back. But the other poles going in near the buildings would be just as far back from the street. Mm -hmm. And where you have the play structure and those trees, um, it really would block off a lot of light. If there's co some concern about maybe between the, the child care center and that driveway that comes in mm -hmm. about maybe getting too much light in there, those can also be set with a, a separate switch off. So they can, you, they can be alternated, so you can have one section of lights controlled separately so that if that's going to be an issue, those can be shut off earlier and you can leave other ones on. Uh, there's a lot of options to do that. I, I had a question about, um, a few questions. One was about the shutoff. How easy is that to do and where does that happen on the pole or remotely? The, the shutoff would happen at, we had. The timer thing. We'd have a time clock and the power source is back in here, and there's actually, there's existing conduit, empty conduit, because a number of years back, apparently, there was a plan to put lighting in the park. So there's conduit that's already installed that goes all the way around this area. So the controls would go back in here, and they'd be in a, a weatherproof locked enclosure, and then it would just be a matter if the time clock time needed to be changed, someone would just need to go in and change that. Um, also, for the proposed lights uh, aimed at the redwoods, is the, uh, trees, is that uh, dark sky compliant? With landscape lighting, it's shining into the trees. I don't think it's going to, you know, that, that's a good question. I don't know what dark sky society has to say about those, actually. So that's a good question. I'll have to look into that. And are these both? types of lighting um, LED compatible? These are all LED oh, they are LED. yes, yes. Another question I had just in response to the public comment we received about mm -hmm. the preference of poles over bollards, mm -hmm. it, when I'm reading it, I'm, I'm seeing that the concern is the aesthetic, um, the eyesore of the bollards, so I'm just wondering if you speak to that. I mean, the one specifically it's, you know, if there, if there is a bollard design anywhere that visually enhances its surroundings, I'm not aware of it. So how would that look? How would the bollards look? Well, that's, that's kind of like artwork. It's all a matter of taste. Some people like bollards, some don't. Um, I, I personally think there are some bollards that I feel are eyesores, like they're the types that have just the, the glass that are very clear and open. Um, I personally don't care for them. Other people do. So... There's not a structural issue that requires like more of a concrete footprint or something, though. No, no. Actually, the bollards require a lesser footing than the poles do. Okay, thanks. So, so I think at this at this time, I think what we'll do is take any comments from uh, members of the public about this particular issue. If you're interested in making a comment about the lighting in Memorial Park, you can step up to the podium. Looks like we don't have any um, public comment. 
So we'll bring it back to the commission to have a conversation about and discussion about this item and we're gonna talk about the bollards versus the poles um, and also the uplighting for the redwoods. Are, are you wanting a choice of the type too? Because there's those choice of the lantern types, no? Uh, yeah, the different styles um, you should choose. The, the one that's the Tuscany is thrown in there as a, it matches more of the architecture of the, of the veterans building. Um, I can tell you that I've seen the other lights in other places besides the ones that are in the park, and they tend to just blend. You don't really notice them. They're really um, low profile. Um, yeah. You have to go up. Just for our home watchers on YouTube yeah, and KLB. Yeah, that's yeah. right, I'm on candid camera. Um, <laughs> The, um, there are plans that were done a number of years back where there was a proposed poll that was similar to the Tuscany poll, which is why we, we pulled that up. But it also does go with the architecture of, of the building a bit, so it was just an option to look at. The, but these round, flat, I, I am actually doing some projects right now at Diablo Valley College, or excuse me, Chabot College and Las Positas College. Las Positas College has a large number of the, the guard code style poles, which are similar to also what's there. And at night with them separated, um, it's just, it's, it's very nice lighting, but it's not real obvious. It's just kind of a, a nice blend. So I, I think it, it's something that, that would serve the park well, so you don't have the visual. Out there, you mentioned in your comments about a house shield, so that there would be something you could put on the lights that could help, you know, minimize the the outshine to right. the houses. Are any of is any of that reflected in any of these? Not in, not in these photometrics or in the cost. Is there a negligible cost? It's, it's a negligible cost. There, there is a little bit of a cost difference. It would be a little bit of an ad because these fixtures, most of these fixtures, I'm actually not sure about the um, the match for the fixture that's out there now, but I know that the guard co poles, they do have what they call an internal shield, and what it does is it stops light from distributing on half of the fixture. So you also wouldn't get, with, with the poles, you're not going to get as much lighting into the area on that particular side, for example but you could definitely do it along where those, those redwoods are or up by the um, entry, the, the northern entry there. Use that to help cut back a little bit. We could even select maybe a few of those poles in a few areas just to make sure that we, we get some cut off and then in other areas leave the full round distribution. Okay. Um, I don't know. I I maybe just state my preference. I, I think the the existing light poles um, replicating that seems like a a nice um, way to illuminate the area and the general area and the path without being too blinding for people mm -hmm. around. Um, so I think I would lean towards something and also very economical. Mm -hmm. uh, those are my thoughts. Dominic, yeah. could you sp speak about the? how much light this is. It's not like a stadium light or a really bright light, like the brightness of it. Yeah, for, for pathway lighting, um, and so for example, I, I actually have some IES recommendations. For an active building entrance, you, you are looking at the, the recommended is about two foot candles, um, which I, I have addressed in this and, and we're able to do that. When you go into, you know, as you get in between poles, the foot candles diminish a little. Um, and some municipalities have, have a minimum, there are recommended minimums. The recommended minimums are three tenths of a foot candle up to a half a foot candle for typical pathway lighting. Um, I'm actually doing a, a project with Annika and they are doing some lighting for a trail, and they were looking for a minimum of three tenths of a foot candle. So, um, it, in the the photometrics with with these with the overlap, you do get up higher to about five foot candles in some areas, but it's typically right underneath the fixture. Obviously, is where you get that brightest amount, but as you go out, it gets lower. So, 
I do like the poles. I like that it illuminates the playground play area a little bit. I know that I've spent um, some time trying to hunt my son down uh, when he was younger uh, <laughs> after a scout meeting or something. They're out on the poles. Um, I, I will say that as, as the person who was on the commission when this was first discussed, I think it was presented as pathway lighting. I don't think we ever thought about lighting the park. So I'm, I'm actually, I like this better, I think, because I do like lighting the, the playground a little bit. Um, as far as the bollards are concerned, um, I like the, num the fact that there are fewer poles than bollards because I just see it as there's a lot of little kids running around. I just see it as a, as a hazard. I like the idea that, um, in my mind anyway, it seems like the poles are easier to avoid. I'm not sure why I think that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but there are fewer of them. And I, I certainly mm -hmm. like that idea. So I, I'm voting for the poles, and I, I think matching what's there, it makes economic sense. It matches what's there. I'm, I'm all for that. Any other comments about the polls versus bollards from Ben or Julia? Yeah, I'm really not quite sure what to think about this. Um, so it, it sounds like this is this came up as as an issue because there were comments received about inadequate lighting um, for parents coming, picking up kids from the from the childcare center in the winter month evenings. Um, and if, if, if that's really the, the issue that we're trying to address, it seems to me that the preferred um, form of lighting should be sort of focused on addressing that particular issue. Um, I'm a frequent user of that park in the daytime and the nighttime, and I've never, um, in the hundreds of times I've been there, experienced any kind of sense that there's a need for additional lighting. In fact, my initial reaction was that, do we really want more illumination here at, the, at night that maybe it's preferable for it to be darker? Um, uh, I don't know if there are public safety issues that have come up in this area in the past where increased lighting might be important, but if not, uh, it seems to me like that we would want to limit this lighting to the minimum necessary to address the problem that it's intended to, to address, even assuming that it really is a problem. And I presume that this wouldn't be coming to us if you didn't think that there needed to be some type of lighting here. Um, and if that's the if that's the case, then sort of I would, I would sort of support whatever um, uh, approach. Uh, uh, produces the least amount of lighting necessary to address the safety issue and is as visually unobtrusive as possible. And it kind of sounds like you could have a fewer number of poles um, to produce the lighting that you would need, and that might be less obtrusive than um, a larger number of bollard, bollards that might be might be shorter. And and I don't know if there's. Are we only limited to poles versus bullards? Are there other options out there to illuminate, illuminate a pathway? Just, this, just those, those are our two options. Huh? Yeah, you, you don't want to put floodlights on the building because you, you will be hearing from the neighbors. So but the floodlight, you don't. But if it's path lighting, you could actually just have like literally path lighting that's not overhead, right? Sort of like. Are you I'm just thinking you, of you path lighting? Very low lighting. profile, pro ground yeah. level. Oh, the, the low ground yeah. level yeah. lighting. Yeah, ground level lighting. Um, you can do that, but it also gets dirty, and then after time, it gets coated with with dirt and everything. Like you're talking, like the, the low lighting with the pedestrian crosswalk. Yeah. And, and well, you're right, or even just like landscape lighting. And you know, maybe it's not functional for this kind yeah, of. I think tra with, with landscape area. lighting, um, landscape lighting does more of an up light. If yeah. you wanted to do landscape lighting that you could direct, then you're going to have something sticking up from the ground, and it's going to get broken. It's a park. So I wouldn't yeah. recommend it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of with Ben, because I, uh -huh. I, this was like the first sort of pass at this, and I think my concern is that the neighbors don't know what they're going to get. Like, I just, I feel like if there's a way to do a mock <laughs> lighting, it just... It's also not a huge, hugely expensive project, but I just wouldn't want to like do something that the neighbors are like, oh my gosh, what's all this like tennis court lighting in my face for? Maybe it wouldn't happen. No, that's understandable. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's and a I big think, concern. and I'm, Shelley did a very good outreach, but I just worry that they don't even know what they're not voting, what they're not here to input. So mm -hmm. that, that's my only concern. Um, and like um, Commissioner Patterson, I just, I almost wish I could just go to a couple parks and see, mm -hmm. so I could have a better sense of 
what it really looks like. It's so hard to visualize yes, you know, on is, the page. But, mm -hmm. um, um, I think the outreach, it sounds like, was very thorough. And I think if people aren't here, I, I think that says something. I, I would argue that we're looking for opportunities to plant trees. If we need to block some light, we plant a tree. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> now, um, Tiffany, can you speak to this? This isn't going to light up the playground like you can play at night. No, no. I, with with some of the poles, you are going to get a little more light throw into it, but it's not going to be mm -hmm. lit. Especially since we didn't look at you know going around the the, the back side of of the, the playground. Sorry, I have to point this way. We didn't look at putting anything in here. My, my main comment is that most of the places that I've been that had bollards were kind of maybe a high-end resort or something like that that wants to do very minimal nighttime along a path, um, you know, lighting, so that it's almost as if it's not lit. And I experienced it as quite dark. So in that space that you're putting your feet, you can see, but you really don't have any sense of being able to see around it. Right. And so for me, the pole lighting provides a better happy medium when I do think, I have been in that park in the mm -hmm. evening, you know, playing and then it gets dark and then you're still there and then you're gonna walk home and suddenly it's a lot darker. Um, and I, I, I can imagine that the child care center, you know, that people are coming with strollers and all kinds of things. Um, so I like that the poles have fewer poles and that there also is a sort of added benefit of a little bit of additional light because I've mostly experienced bollards as quite dark. Mm -hmm. um, so I personally would be in favor probably of the poles that match whatever's there. Um, but I'm also open if people want to take time to, you know, look at other lighting examples. Um, your, your examples are exactly like I addressed in the beginning of the, the pros and cons of the bollards versus the poles. When you have the bollards, you can't identify anyone. If, if you're going to look at this as strictly a security safety issue, you have parents, you have children coming in and out of a space. So my, my feeling is to light it a little bit more. And then in terms of keeping the park not so lit, you can shut them off at any time. If, if the child care center is cleared out by, I, I don't know what time they close, 6 or 6.30, you can have lights out at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And at least you have addressed the issue of safety and, and you know, like I said, I don't, I don't know if you've had issues, crime issues in, in, in that area or not, but these days, obviously, safety is, is, is a big thing, and it's just something that I deal with a lot in, in what I do. In terms of the house shield, so let's, let's imagine if we went forward with pole lighting, um, are house shields things that can be added after the fact once you see what the light flow is, or are they things uh, that you buy in a, a structure that has that already? It's better to buy a fixture that has an, what's called an internal shield. It's actually built into the fixture. So you'll have light shining out this way, but it's not going to shine this way. And that way there's really someone in the house over here might see that there's light casting that way, but they don't see any light casting this way. So it's a very, it's perceived light. It's not that they're actually getting light into their, their space, but it's perceived light. And so you, you get this light flow here. There are fixtures where you can add shields later, but it's on the outside. It's something that has to be added. It's an additional cost. They don't look very good, so then you've gotten into a, a, an aesthetic issue where everyone says you put in these poles and you've got these things added and they just look really okay. ugly. So. It does seem like there's, I think I'm seeing three places for poles that are towards Carmel, sort of, and but there's a fair number of trees between them too mm -hmm. and, the, and the street. Yeah, so yeah. And then these photometrics I did didn't take into account that those trees are going to block off a lot. Um, my photometrics, like I said, it doesn't account for any trees or structures that are in the way. It's just if there was nothing there, this is the, the light distribution that you would have. Um, and those, but those trees are, are very dense down to, to quite a low level. So if you had 
the, the pole is, would be 10 feet, and then the fixture itself is about two feet high, so an overall height of 12 feet. They're not going to see much through those trees. Um, but there again, we could do a, a house side shield or, or something there just along that area to, to help diminish light toward the neighbors. I'm going to make a suggestion that we separate out the redwood up lighting from this and, and first ha see if there's consensus around a motion around the lighting itself. And then if we do or don't have that, then we can kind of discuss the other issue. Is everyone okay with that? If we so. Um, do, do we, I'll make a motion that we consider approving the pole lighting that matches what's there with consideration of a, a more detailed diagram looking at whether any of those ones closer to Carmel should have a shield, if one or two of those need to have a shield to minimize the disruption for any neighbors. I don't know how that sits with the group. So then you'd come back next time with that sort of added information, right, about the shielding, okay. Do we have a time limit on this? Are we racing something at this point or no? A little bit. Gail, Gail might retire. Oh, okay. <laughs> After he tonight, she's saying, no, she just can't go on if that happens. If you're watching so, at home. Watching at home, watching Gail. So I'd really like to wait for the next <laughs> fall. <laughs> Uh, I'll second your motion. I okay, great. Everyone in favor of doing what the motion said, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> great. Anyone opposed? Okay. So that part we're going to move forward, and then um, there'll be a more detailed diagram that has like sort of any that might need house shields or something like that for the next time. We'll research that, and we are looking at going with the fixtures that are matching what's there now. Correct. Okay, and I will make sure. I do. I know that the. The bollards from that manufacturer have house side shield. I would imagine that the big ones do too, but I need to confirm that. Okay, and thank you so much. And we may also decide that they don't, we feel like they don't actually need the shields because of the trees that are already there or they're just not that bright or. And that's fine too. Yeah, yeah if it turns out I'll, it'll be blocked. I will take a look at it. I, the, the calculations that I do obviously aren't going to be exactly perfect, but we, I can certainly semi replicate and we can. And so then I would like to ask if commissioners have discussion around the redwood tree feature up lights um, or yeah, anything people want to think well, about that. My question with the up lights is how much are they focused on the trunk and how much are they just shooting straight up again for dark skies concerns, dark skies concerns. Um, well, the, the whole idea of the up lighting for the trees is to shine up into the tree. Into the tree, okay. So those trees are so dense, you're not going to get anything that's going to pass up and above. Um, I'll make a note here that I, I will research the dark sky criteria. A I'd, I'd be curious and, well, and then. I should know that. So. And then if we make a motion, <laughs> and only, only put that on trees that are fairly right, thick. Right. There and then these there. particular fixtures that I put in there, they're also internally adjustable okay so they can be adjusted to come out or in and then the cover is put back on so people can't play around with them and are these tripping hazards do these stick up a little bit or are they pretty flush? these are these are flush with the ground and, and they will get covered with dirt they will get covered with dirt but since it's just a little lighting bit. for for the trees it's not a concern as if you were doing pedestrian pathway lighting. very good thank you other discussion do we have any motions around this? I'm comfortable accepting do we wanna, this now. I, do we want to go forward accepting it now? I would. I mean, uh, the I fact that the, the angle's adjustable makes a big difference to me and that there's not going to be a ton of them. Yeah. So we have a motion from Commissioner Abbott to accept this uh, redwood up lighting. Do we have a second? Oh, I thought we were going to hear about the dark sky research. Or do you want to wait until next month? Yeah, I mean, it's the same. So what we'll do is it's we'll really up to you. <laughs> so when you when when you come again with the when you do the research about the dark sky, maybe we can just look at the redwood piece again. I think there's interest here, but we want to make sure that it'll be compliant with that. Sure. You could approve it if it is dark sky compliant. There we go. If she finds it that it is not, then it will not move forward. There's there's different rules for dark sky in Title 24, and it's it's a little obtuse when it comes to landscape lighting. Um, I don't think that this would, because they're, they're smaller and they're uplighting for trees, I don't think that it would be an issue, but I, I will confirm that. Uh, Unless, Annika, would you like, do you have any? I, I have okay. <laughs> I, I do see that the, the color of light is important too, so less blue light, warmer light is better. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, typically, or yeah, the, the the real blue light is 5,000 Kelvin, and, and we, we wouldn't do that. Um, yeah. the, most of these exterior fixtures are, are 4,000. Um, there are exterior fixtures. I don't think that these have the option. There are some that actually do have some lower Kelvin at 3,000 3, or 3,500. I, I can check into that, but um, I, typically I would expect them to be about 4,000 Kelvin. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve this if it's dark, for it to go forward if it's dark sky compliant in the research that you're able to do. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second for that? I second that. Everyone in favor of that? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, great. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. I just want to make a public comment. I was in a, I know I'm late for the public comment. Oh, I was yeah. In a, I'm sorry, but we do have to kind of comply with the agenda just because we have people already here. So unfortunately, the general public comment section has already closed. We will have an opportunity at different times in the agenda for public comment. So if one of your comments relates to an item on the agenda, you'd be invited to join at that time. But for this moment, I'm going to have to ask you to just have a seat and we're about to have another presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. Really I'm sorry, but we just have a, we have an agenda that's set. It's kind of already been set. So. Well, I, I have I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to, yeah. I appreciate so much your passion. And what I'll invite you to do is listen to the any of the topics coming up on the agenda. If any of your comments relate to those, you'll be invited just like any other member of the public to participate. At this time, we're going to go on to the next presentation on our agenda. I'm so sorry, but we um, we only can do that at the beginning of the meeting. You well, cannot. Oh, okay. So sorry, yeah, we, can't, you can also, we can't do that here tonight. We have a very also, full agenda and it's part of the Brown Act. You can also email staff and have it uh, forwarded to us. Thank you so much for coming to share with us information about the bocce courts, which is going to be our next presentation. We control the mouse, we'll get there. There we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right. So my name is Annika Swinehart, and I'm here from Restoration Design Group, and uh, we have been tasked with... <laughs> the mic is short for tall people, but I'll do my best. I'll lean in. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have been tasked with helping cheer up your back corner of Ocean View Park. Um, that's the little area circled in orange there and shown here. Um, this part of the park, as you may know, is not actively used the way it was designed. The original plans for the renovation of Ocean View Park had this as a volleyball area, and there's still the volleyball metal upright poles there. Um, some of the turf survives, um, but that's about it. Um, in our field visits to this area, we saw people trying to lounge, getting wet, um, riding their bikes through, uh, but not playing volleyball. So we're trying to help improve that area for the city of Albany into something that might be an actual amenity. Um, the existing conditions, this is some photos we took just last month, um, which illustrate some of the main challenges for that space. Um, it's been described to us by users as dark, wet, and creepy, um, which is not what you're really going for in a public park. Um, and so I was gonna just walk through some of the existing challenges. Um, where's the clicker? Is it working? Got it. Um, two of the main challenges involve the visibility into the space. Um, right now, if you're in the Redwood picnic area or you're in the play area or you're at the tennis courts, you can't see into that area of the park. It's hidden, it's dark, and when you're in that space, you also can't see through to the front of the park or towards the main path. So you, you feel isolated, it is isolated, um, and a lot of that can be, could be solved with some simple pruning. You can sort of see here the sight line that you would want to have. Um, and it's not that many branches that would need to be pruned up um, to give you better light and air circulation through here for visibility. And this is taken from the picnic table. I'm standing on it. Um, but you can see the volleyball upright right here. And that's the gate um, and the sort of improvised path back to um, 
the university villages. And there's no formal circulation through here right now. Um, it wasn't designed into the original plans. And this is a copy of the survey that was done for this project to give us a better sense of the grading. When we visited the site, it was clear that um, the survey that we had from the previous improvements didn't include things that have sort of accreted over time in that back corner. Um, and this, right here, is your existing DG path with wood headers. And what that path is doing right now is acting as a dam for the entire site. That's your catch basin back there. I'm gonna break my neck turning around like that. I'm gonna try if I can. Can you see the mouse on the screen? Mm -hmm. Is that showing yes. up? Okay, so the catch basin here, I've circled the elevation of the rim, which is at 18.36. Um, this entire site uh, has settled over time, and this is a low spot here. And so rain and any surface water is kind of flowing this way and getting trapped. Water is moving this way and getting trapped. You'll notice some low points over here. You've got a nice big wet spot <laughs> over here um, and some other ones here. The headers that surround the Redwood picnic area and the headers on this path are basically giving you your wet, dark, and creepy. Um, and so part of the renovations is to do some fine grading in that area to help water move towards the storm drain um, as well as change the planting and the use of it so that you don't just have dying turf in a mud puddle anymore. But the, the, one of the main challenges is solving the drainage problems that have been sort of accreted over time in that area. Can, can you just quickly point out where the gate is and where the gar yes. garden is? I'm a little turned around on so this, this right here is the gate to University Village um, in the path. And over here is the community garden on this side. This is that little planting area where there's, um, I think, a plum tree or something, and the gates are over here. I mean, this is the main path back towards the tennis courts. And this is um, the, the last existing light feature is right there. Did that help? Yes. OK. And this is where the USDA facility is on this side. And you'll notice our hilarious typo that we've been enjoying in the office all, all month, your chain link finch. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the proposed solution set for your back corner. It's to elevate the area, um, formalize your circulation, um, to sort of make it easy for people to do what they're already doing, which is coming through this gate and then walking forward and then hanging a right in front of the redwood trees to get over here to the main path and then go wherever they're gonna go. Um, and this is the, the connection to that community garden gate and this is the connection to the bocce courts area. Um, I'll go through some of the other parts of this in more detail in the rest of the presentation. But in general, you've got two cork oaks surviving on this site. Those were not planted, I think, Intentionally, the planting plans for the renovations list them as California native oaks, but they are in fact Quercus ubers. Um, they look remarkably healthy for having very wet roots. Those trees don't typically like being soggy for very long. Um, improving the drainage here will probably also help them live a longer, healthier life. Um, but we've centered the bocce courts around those cork oaks. Um, bocce being an Italian sport, it seems appropriate to have some nice cork oaks framing the area. Um, and we've included space here um, for event setup, you could, for bocce rentals, having tables for birthday parties, um, meetings for community garden members, if people are doing volunteer work in the park or having you know, other gatherings, it would be easy to have that be a rental space or just to be a place for other casual gatherings. Um, and we've included circulation connections here to the new path, which would be running, we would remove this portion of the path here and just connect this through to the University Village path, um, but save most of the existing trees on this side. Some of them would, there have been some volunteer tree plantings in this back corner of the park, um, and some of those would need to come out. Um, there's acacias, there's some invasive trees um, that aren't doing anyone any favors, um, and we can instead put in some California native plants um, along those edges. 
Oh, look at that, it chopped off the text. Um, improved circulation is one of the main goals. Um, and what we've shown here is a very simple but clean way for people to connect and move and to have your entries into the bocce court area um, on center with this little planter bulb out from the community garden. So you have a nice entry moment there, but you're not lining it up with the community garden. They still have their own space. They have their own entrance. This is a separate, a separate event. Um, and having a side connection here for people to come in and out um, if they want to go in between the picnic area and the bocce court, but not providing access through here. Um, we didn't want to create a shortcut for people coming in and out of the gate or kids whizzing through on a bike. Um, we wanted this to feel like its own space, but if the commission wanted to, we could include access from that side path and close off the other side, depending on what you feel would be the best use of the space. But our recommendation would be to not have it be a shortcut, have it be a, an enclosed, identifiable space. Um, we could also remove the entry into the Redwood picnic area. Um, we're gonna recommend taking out all those wooden headers, remove your dam so that the water can escape from that area and make it to the uh, catch basin. These are, this line here on the drawing are those old headers. And our proposal is to have this just be a planted green edge, but we could in include sort of informal paths into that area if you wanted to have that be a looser edge into the space. Activating the space. Um, bocce is something that you don't actually have to have any physical prowess to do. It is a sport that can be done by small children, um, the aged, people with a variety of different abilities. Um, it can be done in full daylight, it can be done at night. Um, and we have designed these bocce courts to be ADA accessible so that anyone can roll in, you can play, you can roll out. This is a level entry here. Um, and we'll talk about the, the hardscape when, we, when I look at materials a bit, but it's, it's easy to have a controlled edge for your bocce surfacing and still have an ADA accessible roll-in. Um, this is how courts are now designed at resorts to have side entry gates. You can have sliding gates, you can have them lock, you can have them close. In a public park, we would recommend not having moving parts, but keeping it as simple and sort of as bomb-proof and durable as possible. You're not gonna be having professional competitions in Ocean View Park. Um, so if a ball bounces out the side through some trick, that's probably okay. They can pick it up and, and re-roll. But reducing hinges, things that can get torn off, makes more sense um, for durable environments that are public parks. And um, we did not include an entry on this side. Um, the idea is that you could have two games going at once. You can get in and out of this ADA through any of these three entries, but to have this be a solid, border um, of that bocce court, sort of defining the edge of the space and letting this go to more natural um, creek adjacent planting on that side. And we've allowed space at this end um, for tables and benches. The original scope of work that was sort of given to us by Shelley, um, we were keeping it as minimal as possible and the more we looked at the space the more we realize that people do hang out there. They're not comfortable while they're hanging out there, <laughs> but they do do it. Um, there's a lot of teenagers and kids moving through those gates all the time. Um, and so you could have tables that are either permanent, where we select them, specify them, and install them, and they're bolted down, and they're just there all the time. Or you could have tables that we select and specify and are temporary that you pull out when someone rents the space for a birthday event or a bocce party, um, or you just put them out during the day and you pull them in at night. Um, that again is how you wanna use the space for the park, what kind of programming you wanna have, um, if you want this to be a place that people can hang out in the evening or not. Um, and the same goes for benches. Um, the original plan that we showed Shelley just had the benches for bocce playing, but again, the more we looked at it, People aren't gonna be playing bocce all the time, um, but you still wanna have a, a park space that's, you can go there and meet with your book club, people in the community garden could have meetings, um, you could eat lunch. You know, if you're waiting for your tennis partner, it's a place to sit that isn't programmed. You don't have to do anything, but 
you're in a space. You can enter, you can sit down, there's framed plantings around you, it's a nice place to spend some time. So that's sort of an additional expansion of the scope, but it would tremendously improve the usability of the space, um, and I think make it more than just a bocce court. It would make it sort of part of the park. It could be seen as the bocce garden. Um, you would have the option of doing benches with backs installed permanently in that corner, and maybe the, t the tables are just temporary. Um, but again, that would be a decision for the, for the commission to think about. Do you want this to be you know, a rentable space primarily, or do you want it to be just open and lots of seating? It's, it's up to you to decide. Um, or you could just leave it, you know, open and you can, you can make those decisions later. It's not like benches and tables are hard to install into a space, but it's something to think about in terms of activating that space and making it feel safe and making it feel welcoming. If people have somewhere to sit, they're gonna spend time there, so. And lighting, <laughs> Tiffany. Um, bocce courts are a lot of fun at dusk and part of the problem with that corner of the park is that it is so dark. There's one, if you wanna see a, a light on a pole with no other light around it, <laughs> go to Ocean View Park at night. Um, there's just one pole and it's, it's, this, it's this kind. Um, there, there are lighting plans from the early improvements and it looks like it would be easy to pull the conduit and have one more post at the other end, um, which we've shown here. Where's my little mouse? Right here. Just as wayfinding, it's not gonna illuminate the space tremendously. It's not gonna give you, you know, a blast of light in that back corner, but from the front of the park, once the trees are pruned up, you're gonna be able to see that light as a wayfinding thing of, oh, there's a space back there, and if you're walking and you're coming down from the main path, you turn the corner, it's, it's a legible way to move through space. Oh, there's a, there's a light over here. Oh, there's a light over here. Oh, there's the gate. And there's enough light from the University Village side that it, it sort of triangulates you through there without being a massive lighting improvement. I think just even one post would go a long way for towards making that space feel intentional, safe, and navigable for the people using it. Um, but market lights, cafe lights, are, are a fairly affordable, easy thing to put up. You just need to have wires and metal support posts, and those can be mounted directly into the walls of the bocce court or just at the entries. But having some market lights over the bocce courts, again, these can be on a timer where they're on for the two hours, you know, right after dusk, just to keep that space sort of festive and lit. Even if no one's using it, it will make a huge difference to be looking through those redwood trees from the front of the park. If you're heading for the um, University Village gates to have there be sort of twinkling lights through the redwoods before you get to the gate. It's gonna feel a lot more safe and um, more welcoming. And materials um, are very simple, very durable. We're not going for any fieldstone bocce courts for Albany, um, we're going for uh, durable, easy to maintain, but still really beautiful. Um, I included these two photos of this court here with the yellow balls and the picture on the right. The picture on the right is from Calistoga Motor Lodge, um, and it's a very, very simple construction. It's just PT Redwood, um, and it works, and it gets used heavily, and it's fine. It's rough, it's not the most refined thing, but people love it. If you look over at this court, um, you still have your wood bumper here, but it's just been sanded and treated. So you can, in terms of cost, you can go as high end or as low end as you want, but wood is the standard for the sides so that the balls don't crack or bounce. You, you wanna have you want to have wood on the sides. Um, and with your drainage issues, um, having, having something that's replaceable and durable, but that you're not digging huge foundations and putting in piers to do concrete walls. It seems like a, a huge um, intrusion into a space that doesn't need to be that big. Um, you can build durable, beautiful bocce courts fairly simply. Um, I would recommend using oyster fines for the material rather than DG or any kind of synthetic material. Um, it's the, the particle size is the important thing with the amount of rain and storms getting more increasingly intense um, and frequent as our planet 
continues to change. Having something that will self-level um, is really helpful for maintenance issues. Um, this, D, this is DG over here, and you can see how coarse that is. Um, when you have big rain events, um, it won't settle itself out. It'll pile up a little bit, and you have to come out and rake it. Um, with, the, in, with, the, with the oyster finds, they're a much finer texture, and they tend to sort of self-settle out. Um, there is under drainage on all bocce courts. We will include that. That's part of the drainage solution. Um, it's not an expensive thing to do. It's a necessary thing to do. But oyster fines, wood edges for the bocce courts, and doing some affordable, permeable interlocking pavers for your surfacing to keep it ADA accessible, but not introducing more concrete or more asphalt into the park, but keeping it um, permeable in that area also seems important. Um, you do have uh, this sort of ephemeral creek slash trench uh, channel back here. And you know it was dry when we first visited in October, and when we went back in April, it was bumping. Um, so <laughs> allowing that to happen and allowing water, you know, water to percolate through the site rather than paving this um, seems the best way to go for your park. Um, planting is, I think, what's going to also help frame and create the space. Um, right now, it's a lawn with your chain link fences that just sort of bleeds out. You can see through to the USDA facility. You can see through to the University Village. Um, but at the same time, your view is obscured by these 10-foot fences. So providing um, sort of a continuous green edge here, um, getting some more natives in along this fence line, um, removing the acacias, and putting in things that are going to have deep roots, that are native, that are going to be able to withstand the kind of environment you've got there. It's a north-facing corner. Um, it's shady, and then it gets blasted by sun, and then it's shady again. Um, it's probably pretty dry in the summer, and it's really wet in the winter. Um, so we were selecting plants in a palette that is a mix of deciduous and evergreen, um, would provide pollinators for your community garden. We looked at what was already surviving on site that's native. You've got some California coffee berry that was planted a while ago um, that's really hanging in there along the fence line. Um, and you have some ceanothus farther up towards the playground that's doing pretty well. It's been pruned down into a little tiny shrub, but it's doing fine. So we can, we can plant more of that as well. Um, and in terms of framing, there's your beautiful cork oaks. And I didn't know we had a, an, an Albany forester, which is really exciting. Um, these may need some attention and some help. They're not in the kind of environment they want to be in. Um, but hopefully that will improve when we solve their drainage issues. But again, these could probably be pruned up to give you better light on the bocce courts. Um, but they would need to be assessed for health before they were touched in any way. This plant here, the Westringia fruticosa, is not a California native, but it is a public park survivable version of a California native. Um, it's from South Africa. It's a Mediterranean plant, and it just provides a nice, bushy, low plant that you don't have to prune, so you don't have to send out maintenance crews to do anything. It will stay below four feet and provide you with a nice border around the bocce court to sort of make that feel like a real space. Um, for under the redwoods, um, again, taking out that header and doing some ferns and some other planting on, the, on that edge to also help define the path. Like this is the redwood picnic area, and this side is the bocce court. Um, but those are just some ideas for the planting palette. Low water, low maintenance um, that provide additional benefits for the park, and also an educational opportunity for the kids who are in the playground. And this is um, not part of my design mandate, <laughs> but um, something I wanted to bring up with the Park and Rec Commission um, in regards to this, this particular corner of your park um, and some potential improvements that could be considered to, to elevate that corner um, and sort of improve the park on the whole for, for the community. You have this very tall cyclone fence at the back of the park. Um, there's another fence on the other side of the creek for University Village that's much lower in wood and is a much more residential, um, 
Creekside appropriate kind of a fence. And I don't know if this fence was put up for security reasons, if it's owned by University Village, if it's owned by the city, or why it's so high. Um, there's a locked gate at the other end, um, but you've got this nice wooden wire low fence that's the design move around the community garden that was put in. Um, and if that fence were to be continued over to the gate to University Village, it would drop the, um, the eye obstruction along that creek so that when you're standing here, you're seeing trees and you're seeing houses and this seems continuous. And it feels like it's a part of the park. It's not the back corner, it's not the utility yard, it's not where the garbage cans go, it's part of the park. Um, and right now it doesn't feel like that. And so this would be an opportunity to sort of uni unify your design back there to have that part of the park feel intentional. Um, and it would, you'd still have a fence. Um, it would provide a barrier, but it wouldn't provide something that feels more like an enclosure rather than a fence. Um, so that's one thing. And over at the community garden, um, this is a picture of the catch basin and this concrete drainage trench that runs alongside the tennis courts. You can see it on, scroll back through all, hello chairs. It's over here. There's a, there's a drainage ditch and a catch basin um, that's in between two fences. This is where your community garden is. Um, and this is a tight line storm drain that connects to this catch basin. Um, there's probably a faster way for me to get through all those slides, but I'm not sure what it is. There we go. Um, and this strip here has been planted with fruit trees by the community gardeners because it's the sunniest spot they have. And as someone who is visiting the site for the first time, um, I was like, hmm, why are there so many fences? <laughs> that is an extremely secured catch basin <laughs> because you have, you have a locked fence here um, and you have a locked fence at the other end. And so, there we go. If this fence were to come down, the community gardeners would actually have access to a sunny area that's City of Albany property. Um, and if it was a liability issue with having this open trench, this concrete channel here, it, you could just put metal grates over it or something to prevent, you know, ankle twisting or whatever the concern there was. But it's it's a it's an it's an awful lot of fences in a very small space, and that also contributes to the feeling of being in a utility yard, um, and being in an, in in the back you know, the back service entry to a park rather than having it being a part of the park. So when, you're th when we're thinking about kind of bringing this back corner into the life of Ocean View Park, I think looking at the community garden and the levels and the amounts of your fencing in that area might, might go a long way towards elevating the visual and the physical sensations of being in that space. So that was a lot. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation. I wanted to ask if any of the commissioners have clarifying questions for Annika before we uh, open it up to public comment. Um, I was curious for the one proposal of um, pressure treated for the uh, boundary. Um, that seemed fine in a lot of ways. I was wondering if that's uh, allowed for public parks where kids would play on it. It is. Um, currently, pressure-treated wood it does not have the arsenic and the cadmium and the other treatment. That's all been banned a long time ago. Um, however, because when you see it, it visually looks the same, it can cause concern from the public. Um, and so often, even if we're using that, we'll often do a cap of, of a nicer clear heart redwood or cedar, and we'll sand and polish that so that you've got a nice clean trim on the top, and the pressure-treated portions won't be as visible to the public. And then I was wondering for the cafe lights, it looks really nice. Uh, is that, um, how frequently are, is that used in public spaces and how durable would you say that that kind of thing is? It's as durable as the installation. Um, and, but at the same time, it's not designed to have five-year-olds hanging from them. So it's also a matter of how high you install them. They're, at this point, 
almost de rigueur in outdoor eating courts um, and in outdoor public spaces. And they get installed at resorts and other public spaces with heavy use, but not necessarily um, heavy child use. So I, I would think that if they were installed high enough where kids couldn't get to them, you could qualify them as durable, but I'm looking at Tiffany. <laughs> as long as yeah, as long as they're high enough. Big kids, yeah. That brings up another, I've, I haven't played bocce, and how, how high do people throw the balls? Would that get in the way? How high do you, bocce and the cafe lights would not be a conflict. Um, if your balls are going high enough to hit the market lights, you've just really irritated some friends because you probably hit them first. <laughs> but um, it's, yeah, you just have four balls and a little polino, and someone rolls the polino, and you all try and hit the ball, and you, um, you can have bocce courts up to 90 feet long, and you can build backstops because some styles of play, people really go for it. But on a on sort of a standard um, recreational 60 by 10, you don't really need that because you're not, even if you're trying to do a trick shot and it hits the end, it's just gonna pop up and come back down. They're not, they don't really bounce. They kind of more whack, I think is. Thud. Thud, the technical description, I'm sure. But. And it's a, it's a roll. Yeah, it's a roll. There's no like, oh, okay. it's not dodgeball or anything. And then the path from the gate, the UC Village gate, um, that uh, you mentioned that they would often want to curve east and then go the other way. But I, it, I see it does sort of continue there and people who want to go west, either to the, to the beach or to the Pier Street Park or to the whatever, um, does that connect to something? Yeah, the idea is to have it connect um, kind of to where I'm standing in this picture. Um, this whole edge of the park could be completely reasonable circulation. And it, there's an actual concrete patio area with a bench by that play area. Um, and the idea was to have that pathway connect up to the play area so that if you really are just heading up that way, you don't have to cut over and come around and come through. Um, and it would also keep bikes from riding, if you're just riding your bike, um, from cutting through the picnic area. Um, right now, all the trails sort of dump you into the Redwood Grove, and you've got to like find your way through that to get somewhere else, which doesn't make any sense. So it's just giving people a path around the Redwood Grove on either side, and we would connect it to the existing concrete pad up by the play area. Uh, so you still go through the parking lot? Uh, yeah, along the ball field to connect to the Buchanan bikeway. Yeah. yeah. And so this, this is the fence over here um, by the USDA, and this is the Redwood header for that area. So there's, there's plenty of space in here um, to connect the path forward. So the proposed path would go all the way to the parking lot so people could... No. no. Would stop at the uh, play area? I didn't put in the... It intersects with the play area before it gets to the parking lot. You would have to then go, you would eventually have to take a right anyway to get to the parking lot. It doesn't whack you all the way through. It, it you, doesn't connect to paving. You, you can walk between that USDA fence and the building, but it'd be on grass or something. I mean, I've done it. Can we get the internets in here? So the, um, the, there is not, not a path there. So this is the backside, the USDA, and then picnic area. You, there's nothing there right now. But the path would go up to that, and then it would run into the cement pad, which is where the playground is. There's a fence there. You can scooch you around the uh, playground there and behind the Friendship Club, but there's a few uh, electrical boxes and a bunch of utility boxes back there. So it's not really the approved path. So this would get you up to the playground and then you would make a right and then you would come yeah. up to the ball field and then go along the uh, sidewalk. Okay. So it does connect you to the pad by the, okay. Yeah. I have a question about um, before public comment about what we're being asked to do because I noticed it's to approve the concept plan, which I think, I mean, generally, I'd love to hear what the public thinks, but I, it looks like a really beautiful design. But there are a lot of elements that will add a lot of cost, and we only, you know, and so I'm just wondering if that is something we're being asked if we're approving this. I mean, obviously, we haven't seen any numbers. I'm just wondering. No. So this, these plans are all schematic design plans, and part of our contract with um, the city was to produce schematic design plans for just a general concept review of is this what you want in your park? And then the next phase after you're like, yes, we would like this in our park, um, 
we go back and we start doing the, the construction drawings and cost estimates and we do another round of review with Shelly where we send her, okay, this is what you want in your park, here are the design decisions and this is the cost estimate. And then she can, we can come back and say, this is the cost estimate for this, is this what you want? And when we did our initial contract, we were told that there was about $50,000 um, for construction for the bocce courts and so we pared it down to that in the process of doing the survey and looking at the drainage and looking at the opportunities. There's a bunch of stuff that you could do there that would push you outside of that $50,000 range. Um, improving the fencing, providing more seating than just the bocce courts, um, improving the lighting, um, improving materials. Um, so I guess my, my yeah. sort of point is that like I understand that and so I don't want us to be approving a plan without the cost and then going down the road of creating the engineering design and then be like, oops, too expensive. You know, I'm just wondering how we can be efficient in what we agree to do today so that we're not, you know. You, you can approve this without seeing the numbers and then our job as designers is to present um, the best cost estimate we can at a midpoint, it, it goes in tandem. We do the cost estimate and the, the design and the engineering together. So it's PSNE, plans, specifications, and estimates. And we provide those to Shelley and you for a review um, before continuing. And then there's also the opportunity to say, okay, this is what the whole enchilada would cost. Um, we only want to spend this much money. We can phase it. We want to do this part first, this part second, okay. this part third. So the engineering wouldn't be fully borne out because that would I know that that costs a lot of money, so we can be, we can weigh in and say. Yes, okay. yes. Any other clarifying questions before we open up for public comment? <laughs> All right. Do we have any bocce comments in the crowd? All right, then we'll come back to the commission for discussion. There's the concrete. And <laughs> I found it. Oh, is this the path? <laughs> oh yeah. I was determined. Um, yeah, so here's, here's your wet lawn, and here's the snaking existing path, and here's your redwood grove. And the path along this side would connect up to this area here. There's a paved area here on this side of the play area. So you can't, you can't zip through on the other side of the, the teaching units, but you, you can connect up to here, and then you swing around to head over. Does that answer the question about where the concrete is? Yeah, it does, okay. thanks. It's no surprise to anyone that's been on the commission for some time that I'm very excited about these plans as an avid lover of bocce. Um, and I, I like the concept a lot and I understand what you're talking about in terms of phased. So for my money, or poor choice of words, but <laughs> from where I'm sitting, I feel great about what you presented and I'm interested to see kind of the next steps, but I'm curious if there is other discussion amongst commissioners or things that we want to talk about as a group related to these concepts. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that um, I have a high, I, I very much like what I see, and I have a high degree of confidence um, um, that Shelley and you will be able to sort of further develop these plans in a way that you know, is is going to be really positive for the community. I think that that it, it seems like a, a critical issue is the connectivity, visual and physical, and it seems like you're really thinking about that, and that's something that I'm sure you'll be prioritizing as you're further developing these plans. Um, I really like a lot that you've shown in terms of how to sort of activate the space and make it a, a, a welcoming and inviting place with a sense of, in, of an enclosure um, while providing that connectivity to the surrounding area. So I think that that's all looking really good. I really like what you showed with the market lighting um, and exploring that further and seeing if that could really, that could really work. But I think this concept um, really looks great and, uh, and uh, I thank you for the thought that you've put into this so far. Thank you, you're welcome. Yeah, I agree, I think it's a really beautiful design. Um, I would love to do all of these elements, but I can just imagine the markup <laughs> for every single one of these things. I did landscaping at my house and you know, it adds up very quickly. So it'll be interesting to see what the figure comes back like, but in terms of the, just the overall design, I think it's really well done. So. Yeah, it seems I second all that. And I used to pick up my kids at Friendship Club there for several years and 
Um, I totally agree the creepy thing and the whole, uh, and just, I actually had no idea that the rest of the park was back there because of the, 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 the curtain of, of trees and uh, it wasn't until years later that I actually started looking around back there and um, so I am interested to see uh, how the different parts uh, price out. May I? <laughs> uh, I, I am also well familiar with the creepy aspect, and I think a lot of the creepy aspect... Everyone's been creeped out back then. <laughs> well, that's the perfect word for it, because it's creepy. And I think a lot of it comes from the real hedge of trees that, that is the border of UC Village, and I don't think you can do anything about that. They won't let you trim them. Um, we've, we've tried to have them trim for the, the, uh, the public garden. Yeah, we've been able to trim them up the you fence. Going up the fence, but they won't let you thin them or anything like yes. that. Yes. So there I aren't think as many down on that bocce section as there are in the community garden section. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I think lighting is going to be really important. And, okay. and um, uh, I, I love the idea of the market lights, but I'm, I'm skeptical that as, as aggressively as that, even that creepy part has been, I've seen used by my son's soccer team and, and the kids playing there when I'm playing softball. I mean, there's a lot of unsupervised youthful yeah. teenage activity going back there. Um, there's enthusiastic use enthusiastic, of the space. Yes. Yes, so, so I'm skeptical that that would be a, an ideal long-term solution. So maybe another alternative that brings a little more light uh, would be something to consider. That's just, mm -hmm. just what I'm, you know, some thought. You know, and piggy tailing off of what Tiffany said in her presentation, I mean, there's also the option of um, incorporating, you know, the existing lights that are already in the park, those, the blue sort mm -hmm. of historic poles, and having them having more than just the one, um, but putting, placing them in such a way that you can run wires on them so that if you want to have a special event, you can run market light. I mean, it's not hard to, as long as you have the vertical supports and you have the, the wire to support the market lights, you can put them up and run them fairly easily off of you know, an outdoor outlet at the base of the pole light. And so that could be an optional thing rather than the main source of light. I just fell in love with the idea of seeing no, those twinkly lights it. It through the redwood nice. trees. It's <laughs> fabulous but, for a resort. I'm not sure about yeah. you, but that's just, I know. Uh, and, and one advantage of that, that, that uh, hedge of or the, the tall trees is going to keep University Village from complaining about the lights because yeah. it's, it's not going to get through. <laughs> Um, but other than that, I, I very much like that. And, and to the point of concern about cost, um, one thing that the commission could do um, prior to the start of this project being bid or constructed is that you also have the option of, as part of your maintenance, taking out the headers around the Redwood picnic area and, and you know, pruning those trees up and doing a health assessment on the cork oaks and starting some of that work um, prior to this happening. Like, you don't actually need to wait. Sure. For this project. So I'm going to make a motion that we approve the concept um, as presented here for further development and um, yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Everyone in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, great. Thank you so much. So now we get to the part of the meeting where we're going to review five tree removal applications. So the first one is at 1137 Portland. I think we have a presentation by John. All right. Um, first one up is a removal of two purple leaf plum trees that was applied for by the property owner. And they're on the Stanage side of Portland Avenue. Um, there are two long neglected trees um, with a lot of dead wood, a lot of poor structure and um, fungus growing on portions of it. We have some large dead limbs. Um, there's a lot of decay. There's a lot of old wounds that haven't healed correctly and they're uh, decaying. There's a lot of, this is, uh, I imagine from vehicles, this is on street side. Um, it's a close up. It's trying to, trying to heal over, but it's, it's decaying on the inside the wound there. There's another wound, another wound that's not healing over. We have some, most of the growth is the sucker growth that's popping out here and there, um, which is poor, poorly um, attached growth on the tree that doesn't have uh, good long-term stability. There's some cracks in some of the trunks of the trees. There's poor, um, unions of uh, stems of the tree. Um, this is 
the northmost tree. This is the better of the two, but again, there's almost half of it's dead. Um, and this is the south tree, and this is probably 80% dead, and this is the one with a lot of fungus growth and a lot of dead wood. So my, my recommendation is to have both of these removed and replaced with something suitable to plant under high voltage power lines. Thank you. Is there any clarifying questions from the commission? Okay. So do we have any public comment about this tree removal application at 1137 Portland? Nope. Okay. So any discussion amongst the commission? This don't look like healthy trees to me. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have a motion? I move to approve the application. Second. All right. Second. Everyone in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. The next tree on the tree removal application list is at 1494 Solano Avenue. Okay. Um, 1494, this is one that I'm submitting the, the uh, removal request for. Um, it was brought to my attention by some neighbors that have business the next property to the east, I, I believe. Um, this is the tree. A lot of what you see is background foliage. This tree doesn't have too much foliage on it. There's a smaller uh, tree to the right that's the same species tree, but that's on private property. Um, the tree has had some sidewalk work. I think possibly a drainage pipes coming through there. Um, there was more than likely some root pruning done when the, the sidewalk was repaired. Um, it's kind of spilling over its basin onto the curb and the sidewalk. But mostly the tree, all the trees on uh, San Pablo were pruned last year, I think, early last year, uh, on Solano, sorry. Um, and this tree did not look like this maybe last January 2018, I think it was, when they were pruned. So this tree is rapidly dying back, and every, every week I go by this, there's less and less foliage on the tree. Um, a lot of these limbs are completely dead and need to be addressed one way or the other. We could prune the limbs off, but there would be not much. It wouldn't even qualify as a Dr. Seuss tree, I don't think, at that point. <laughs> so anyway, that's... This one I'm requesting to have it removed and replanted. Um, we were replanting trees on Solano with trident maple trees, so more suitable tree. Any questions from the commission about this tree removal application? Public comment about this tree? Discussion amongst the commission? Oh, sorry, yes, please feel free to step up to the podium so, so we can get you on camera. Uh, so, I actually, I, I was not aware of this tree being removed, but I was aware, I am aware of the tree, the next tree um, that is slated the fifth, at 1552 Solano, and they're the same kind of tree. Um, they are the peppermint, uh, the peppermint willow, um, and they look to be about the same age, and they look to be experiencing a similar issue, which is that they're growing over the concrete basin. Um, I actually uh, had a certified arborist go out to look at the tree that's at 1552 um, Solano, and um, it seems to me that there, you know, there is definitely dead, um, you know, dead wood, dead material that needs to be removed from both of these trees, but that it very well may be that these trees are in decline, but that um, there's sort of a um, less... Um, severe solution than to have these trees removed, um, but that instead we could have um, an aerial review of, or it was an aerial um, uh, assessment of the trees done, and to see whether you know whether there are um, branches that are dead that can be removed. Um, whether there's actually anything wrong with the trees in terms of infestation. Uh, these particular kinds of trees are really only susceptible to one kind of infestation, which is like a fungus or a mold that should be pretty readily um, visible 
uh, by looking at the leaves. Um, the other possibility is that um, you, uh, there might be root rot, um, which would be hard, you know, you, you can't do much about that, but it doesn't mean that the trees are immediately going to be you know, dead trees. Like the one that the uh, certified arborist looked at today at 1552 Solano, he said that, you know, if, if we were to, um, you know, uh, manage the decline of the tree as the tree sort of goes into its final years, um, it, still, it still may have 10 years left in it. Um, and then just looking at this from a cost-benefit analysis, I mean, like you have these trees, they have tremendous roots underground. And so if you're really going to replant something in this space to remove a tree of this of these size, um, of this size, the two of them, um, and remove that root ball um, to be able to actually use this space and replant something, that's gonna cost, it, it might be in the five figures for each of the trees. Um, uh, and it just it might not be something that we actually have to do right now. The other thing to look at is whether or not that cement space that is the um, the container that contains what what it looks like from both trees is that the cement is sort of choking the the trunks, um, and so the the trunks are not getting the minerals and the the nutrients that the tree needs. And so one alternative to look at is whether or not we can remove some portion of the concrete around the trunks, either on, you know, it looks like on the sides is a possibility, um, so that the tree has more, more room to, uh, to expand. So that, those are, you know, I would, you know, I, it looks like to me from the, that these trees are probably, you know, 40 years old, maybe. Um, and so they, these trees can live to 150 years. I don't know that these are, trees have that much life left in them, but the idea that there might be 10 years left in the, of life with them, um, it just feels like we haven't, we don't have enough information yet about, you know, what, um, if there's some sort of uh, less intrusive means to allow these trees to continue to be here and sort of manage them as they decline ultimately. And could you say your state your name just um, yes your sure. my name is Laura Villarreal okay yeah thank you uh -huh. any other public comments about the application at 1494 Solano okay then just I'm going to open that up for discussion amongst the commission I was curious John if you have a, a theory about what caused this rapid decline um, I, I, I don't know for sure if to find out it's some kind of bacterial, fungal, some kind of uh, inf infection, infestation, whatever. We would have to do samples and take them to a laboratory and it's, it's expensive and we don't typically do that. Um, I, I understand the sentiment to, to manage a tree as it's dying, but in a location like this, a tree like this is uh, a risk to the public, so. Um, it, and it looks like some pretty aggressive pruning was done. Was that, we, was that last year or was that recently when you noticed problems? We did pruning last year to remove dead wood and, and mo mostly remove dead wood, I think it was on this So, tree. so all the, the, the cuts so there were a year ago January is what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, a lot, or, a lot or of it. earlier, it's hard or to earlier, say but, from, but, from this picture, yeah. but a lot of it. Um, but since then, everything that's dead on the tree has died back since then. It's really then, rapid sure. and okay. um, concerning to see that kind of fast dieback on a tree. So. Okay, thank you. Does anyone feel that they would like to make other comments or discussion? I'm, I'm prepared to uh, vote to approve this due to the public safety um, concerns. I'm wondering um, uh, what sort of the future for the other eucalyptus trees on Solano is, and do are there proactive things that the city could do or would we want to do to maybe um, you know, do more to protect those trees? Sure. Um, well, one option, one thing that we can do when we do, when there's sidewalk work being done, we try to open up the base and give it a little bit of room, but we're, it's very limited on Solano Avenue. Mostly what you do for a tree to rejuvenate is, is in the soil. 
and there's no access to soil on these trees. The other one more so, this one has a little open space on either side of it, but um, we prune them. Um, as, as for the, the other trees, they're all about the same age, and we did take one out a uh, year or two years ago, maybe Church on the Corner had a tree like this that dropped a big limb, and that tree was probably not in as bad shape as this particular tree. Um, so right now we're just managing them, pruning, and um, at, a, at a certain point, my, my feeling is we say the risk is not acceptable and we need to do more than just prune out dead wood off the tree. Um, so. I just want to say I really appreciate the, the comment made because I agree that, you know, these are really valuable trees, the age, but this particular tree I'm not really, you know, married to, which this commission knows that I make a big fuss about other trees, but this one just because of the what I'm seeing there in terms of the dieback. Um, but I do think I'd like to consider this more, this idea of proactive maintenance as Ben's suggesting and, and what we can do, even when a tree is in decline, how we can actually try to manage it. So it actually, um, one, so that we can revive it if possible, and then also just to be more you know, to get a second opinion if we if it's a really valuable tree like this before we do something irreversible like cut it down. And on that note, I will move that we <laughs> go forward, though, approving this particular 1494 Solano application. Mm -hmm. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. And everyone in favor? Great. Okay. So we'll move to the next application, which is a similar tree, I guess, at 1552 Solano. Yes, uh, same species tree. Um, this one's in a, in a little bit better shape, but again, there's a lot of kind of rapid dieback on the tree. The, this tree was pruned at the same time as the other tree about a year a year or so ago. Um, what's more, mostly most of concern, well, right now there's this one large dead stem, but if you look at the stub towards the bottom, that came crashing down recently, and that's almost a 10 inch diameter limb that fell in a bus zone and were, um, the, this limb had was green also, this had green foliage on it. So there's something going on with this tree that's making it unstable and again, a risk to the public. Here you can see where um, pieces of it, well, well, over to the extreme right is the actual limb and there's pieces of it laying around here and there. We're lucky there was no one in the bus stop or a bus or, or vehicles there. Um, so that's really the concern with this tree. If, if it were just that limb, I would have the stub removed and try to monitor, monitor the tree. But I'm seeing that second limb is, is completely dead. And every time I look at this tree, it looks a little sparser and sparser as well. So I think this is in rapid decline also. And, um, I, I hesitated on this. The, um, I can't remember when that limb came down, but it was several months ago, and I've been looking at the tree, and I'm not um, not comfortable with leaving this tree in place. And as far as replanting the trees, th this tree in particular is about a foot or two feet from a, a sewer line, so we wouldn't replant right in that spot. We'd have to establish a new basin somewhere nearby in that general area. Would that mean that you'd cut into the concrete? Or? Yeah, okay. yeah, we'd cut out a new basin and plant a, a different type of tree. Any other questions for John about this tree? All right, public comment. We'll note that we had a previous comment about this tree as well as the previous tree, um, just so the record reflects that. Any other public comments about 1552 Solano tree removal? All right, discussion? I think there's a similar public safety concern that's a very alarming branch. But right. It, it seems unusual to me to see the branch just drop like that, just part way. It's not at a joint. It's just how common is that? Is it was that a stress point, or you have no idea? With uh, these trees, I'm not yeah. so sure. It's, it happened with the tree on yeah. um, Church on the Corner. A similar thing it was a green um, tree full of foliage that came down. 
This tree, I've, I had, I was out there looking at it, and someone, I believe, from the bike shop came out and told me that an arborist had looked at it and was alarmed at the state of the tree. And I really didn't see the alarm. I, you know, I know the limb came down, and I was concerned about that. But there's, there's something else going on. Um, other eucalyptus have what's called sudden limb drop. This okay. might be a similar thing where limbs, green li limbs, just unexpectedly yeah. pop out of the tree. And, yes. um, but this one, again, with the continued dieback and the second uh, stem that's dying back, it's more of a concern. Yeah, I would say, you know, I think in that, we talked about the church on the corner a couple times now, and I think I remember being concerned about that removal request, which we approved, because I think you had even said, like, one limb drop doesn't necessarily mean another one's going to drop. Like, you, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a predictor that all the limbs are going to drop. Yeah. But I think in this case, you're seeing something more than just that one limb as a, as a sort of um, indicator of the tree's health. And I just, the same arborist I think that you're mentioning is actually our arborist who also mentioned that this tree, he had mentioned that that tree was a hazard. So I mean, for that reason, even though it looks pretty nice in some ways, like just from here, I do, you know, I would agree that, you know, just because I've heard from two arborists that to support the removal for public safety reasons. So is that a motion from you then? I hate giving the motion for that kind of thing. I'll let somebody else do that. Okay. I, mo I move we... Uh, approve the application. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Everyone in favor? Aye. Okay. So then we'll move on to the removal application for a tree in Memorial Park. Okay. Um, Memorial Park, we, we've had a, an outside uh, arborist firm do some tree risk assessments on all the, all the three parks, the three main parks. And I received an email while he was in Memorial Park, and he felt that this tree needs to come out as soon as possible. It doesn't look all that unhealthy, but um, closer inspection, I have a good picture. There, there's some fungal growth on the bottom, which indicates decay in the root zone and in the, in the, the bottom of the trunk of the tree. Um, he did some sounding, basically hitting the tree to see if it sounds solid or has some hollowness, and he, he, he felt that the tree's becoming hollow. And due to, uh, due to the location of the tree, which is in between the tennis courts, the baseball field, and memorial, the memorial building, and situated right in the middle of the community garden, um, I think this tree is also a safety risk and something that we should take out. Um, part of being in the garden, I think they've piled up some soil and planted things and probably keep it well watered, which is also feeding the fungus in the, in the root zone of the tree. So um, we take this tree out. We have more sunlight for the, the garden there. Um, we could replant somewhere else in Memorial Park, or, or we could replant in, in the garden there. But I think we'd probably rather have sunlight there. And, I have some questions. Are you done? I just sure. Make sure. Uh, one is, I read that email that um, Aaron, Aaron, or the tree, you know, yeah. consultant wrote, and I interpret it a little differently than that this needed to be immediately taken out because he writes, you know, he definitely wanted to alert you um, and named all the things that you just named, but it was the other acacia tree that he said should be removed immediately. I didn't see in that email that he wanted it to be removed immediately. So I just wanted to first ask you about that he in in his report which I just received yesterday the final reports on the parks um, he indicates this as one for I don't know if he says immediate but a removal um, I don't know if he, he uses the term immediate in here okay. but it's um, it, also I'm wondering if you um, talk to the community garden people about that, because I'm wondering if that tree actually provides some partial shade for their garden, which they may actually value. I'm not sure who the, the gardeners are in this section. Is it the high school? It's the Edible Landscape um, Project. This is where it started. So it's a volunteer the group. It's on the other side. Of the yeah, it's connected. It's the same group. OK. Is this? Um, how often does this survey of park trees happen, and are we going to be getting um, more requests, or is this pretty much it from the what this person identified? 
This is the first time we've done this. Um, it, we looked at the parks. We had some uh, dead trees. We had a tree come down in um, Terrace Park, <clears throat> and that's what kind of initiated the idea to let's take a closer look at all the parks. So we we got uh, qualified tree risk assessment qualified people to do do the the inspections and. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to continue or if we're going to do this every couple of years. I don't think we will be doing this every year, but it might be every five-year thing or something. So out of all the trees in all the parks, they identified how many that they think should be removed? Three. The, the camphor and terrace, um, the acacia and acacia and ocean view. So, and they, they recommended other work, including the redwoods and ocean view. They need a lot of cleaning up, and we can raise them when we do the cleaning up. And um, just basic, you know, they do a rating based on probability of the tree failing, probability of it hitting a target, how valuable the target would be, that, well, that sort of thing. So, um, so this one again, being his feeling, it, it, it most likely will fall towards the building, which isn't necessarily the good choice, but it also if it fell in another direction, it's falling onto a, a game, a ball field or a tennis field or uh, tennis court. If it were to fall towards the building, is there insurance on the building that would pay for it to be upgraded to current code? <laughs> <laughs> There's your funding strategy. Sneaky. This, this could be it. This could be just, just what we need. Just what we need. <laughs> So if we cut a few notches in just the right place. So we should water more around the, the base. Of the On one side. Any other questions for John about this tree before we open it up for public comment? Any public comment? Please feel free to step on up to the podium if you can share your name and then um, we'll have a timer for the public comments. Thank you. So my name is Francis Kelly. And um, I'm interested in this tree because I feel like have kind of a personal relationship to it. I, when I wake up in the morning, I look out my window, I see the tree. Uh, and it's this sort of beautiful, verdant backdrop to Memorial Park, or to Memorial Hall. Um, I totally understand the safety concerns. Um, I go to Memorial Hall many times a month for scout meetings. I, there's a batting cage there. I play there with my kids. I walk past the tree tonight. Um, I've seen, and there's a tree that fell in, in King Park or Hopkins Park in, in Berkeley, which I've seen. I, the safety concerns are very real. That said, taking out this tree, uh, that is a completely irrevocable move. And it will completely alter the landscape of that area of Albany. I mean, if you are standing at the corner of, of Portland and, and Carmel, uh, that tree defines this kind of halo behind Memorial Hall. So what I would say, safety concerns are irrelevant, but I would say I would encourage all of you to read through that report very carefully. But beyond that, actually, to get another opinion a secondary opinion, tertiary opinion. Because this is kind of like, I, if someone was talking about amputating your leg, you would want to get multiple opinions before you made that decision. This is kind of like an amputation. Um, as I said, if, you, if we take out that tree, it is going to forever alter the view, the, the visual landscape you have in that part of Albany. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any additional comment? Great. My name is Gerhard Brostrom, 1116 Curtis. My wife and I are founders of Transition Albany. We're also very involved with the living uh, life that's in this park. We returned tonight from a trip out of town to see the, the sign on the tree. Um, so we're concerned because it's a very tight time frame for us uh, to react to the proposed elimination of our tree. I, and I say our tree because we've worked there many years to produce what, we've, what we're showing here. You may also know, and I'm sure you know, there's people that don't know this, but we have another community garden on the other side. And various people work in these two gardens. And I must say my wife and I are pretty much the ones that keep, keep this one going. So. Now, I admire very much this, the attention given to trees in Albany. And I've been here before talking about street trees with Tree Tony. And we were very happy to have him help us with this park, including most of the plant beds we're looking at right now are Tree Tony's help. A lot of you know that. 
We have huge problems in Memorial Park. Problems go on year after year after year. They involve huge amounts of vandalism. This last week we had toxic, I was out of town, I was in Death Valley and I got a message saying I gotta get over there with sawdust because somebody dumped a gallon with the toxic chemicals and I need to get there right then from Death Valley. Uh, the fire department came some hours later and I was notified it was taken care of. But this is the kind of thing we're faced with almost every week. Fires in the restrooms. We're talking about 10 hours of trash pickup. Broken glass tonight, there was broken glass. Anyway, I'm just saying, I want to be considered a stakeholder, particularly with this tree and moreover with Memorial Park. The volunteer efforts that have gone into this, this, this area for years and years and years, we're doing fine but we need support from you. And I'm very glad to hear that somebody read the report from the consultant very clearly and saw that he did talk about how immediately the other tree needed to be removed and not ours. So we may be just fine with your taking that tree out, but I will say we recently planted some hookah at the base of it. Also, other things that I'd point out around that tree is it's basically a kugel demonstration. In other words, many, many trees, uh, branches and lots of detritus is put in one place and it's not watered very much at all, even though we have some plantings there. My wife reminded me that it's very, very um, dr drainage prone. And so um, I think we need to really look at the use of that space and the fact that we've heard today from the previous speaker that it's gonna change the character entirely. This is our shade side. Now you can see what's gonna happen when that tree's gone. There'll be much less shade for our plantings there. Um, I'd like to see it delayed. We'll Thank meet you. with our garden managers tomorrow night at our potluck for, with purpose. Two managers that very much are interested in this, so we hope that you'll forbear. Thank you so much for your comments. Any other comments? So I'm gonna bring it back to the commission for discussion. So John, other, th other than the email from Aaron, is there additional information that Aaron has provided about the health of this tree? Um, in the final report, he is listing, first of all, he's saying the probability of a failure is probable, likelihood of impact is high, failure and impact is likely, the consequences severe, and the risk rating is high. Um, in his email, he said there's two trees that should be immediately addressed, so. Yeah, but just clarify, he didn't say this, should, this one should be immediately removed. I just wanna clarify that for the commission. Um, I would say, you know, when, because this new report has come in, um, and we haven't had a chance to review it, I personally would not feel comfortable at all making a decision on this tree, given, um, given that alone. But I also went to the tree today, and um, it's gorgeous, I mean, I look, just looking at it, you can't. I can't see a thing wrong with it. But who am I? You know, I'm an arborist, but still, I just, it's beautiful, full, not even like a yellow leaf on it. And um, it was shading the entire building of, of Veterans Hall. Um, and I think one thing that I've, I've presented here before is this idea that, you know, we have this urban heat island effect. We have climate change, rising temperatures. And one of the um, best mitigators are trees because they actually absorb um, the heat around, and so it can actually really cool that building. Um, it provides shade for the tennis courts at some point, too. Um, and I just think generally it's just such a valuable, beautiful tree. I mean, I, I don't even know how many years old it is. John, I don't know what you might estimate. It looks like 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years old. You can't really tell from this picture, and so I just want to sort of impress upon the commission that this is just an exceptional tree that I think is worth a second opinion, a third opinion, definitely a thorough read of the report before we make a decision. I would agree that looking at the fuller report probably makes sense given the size of the tree and um, given that it, it didn't clearly say about the removal, although I do think it says immediately addressed. So perhaps if it were possible to have this on the agenda for next month and revisit this particular tree after circulating the full report and also uh, it sounds like that would give time for any other stakeholders to be able to participate fully. 
that would be my suggestion. Yeah, I, I like that too. And I would just also say that this, you can't tell here, but it's like behind the Veterans Memorial Building and it's been raining lately. So it's, it's great that you all saw the notice, but I think uh, I can imagine a lot of people didn't see the notice just because they, it's been raining and they haven't been in that part of the park. So, and Notices I know it's- went out to 60 residents within the, the vicinity. Oh, it did, uh, actual, I, okay. I, when I said yeah, that. but I mean, Memorial Park is a public use for the whole city, not just. It was also 16th. posted on the street by the entrance on the pole. Um, I, I couldn't see it when I pathway. went in, but yeah, I know you can't do every. That's great that you did do that mailing, but I'm just. I think that a lot of people use that area, not just the neighbors. So. I, I would say that the, the fungus at the base does bother me. That kind of scares me a little bit. Yeah, but that, that's, I, that's a, a conch, not a mushroom. A mushroom pops up sure. overnight and it's soft and fleshy. This and is coming out from it's been growing for years. It's not a huge one. I've seen them huger. I've seen trees standing um, with huge conchs on them, but usually in the middle of a forest somewhere, where if the tree falls, it falls. So, so given that, I, um, I, I would say, however, that I think that the folks who've been working on this garden have, have earned at least a delay in a month in reconsidering. Give them an opportunity to have their meeting. Perhaps they might want to have another arborist come and look at it. But I, we certainly must, you know, in appreciation of all that they've done, we can certainly give them another month. It's at least my opinion. Yes, I, I concur with this. I think, I think this is an example of a, of a tree removal that, that is quite significant, and we want to make sure that it's really necessary um, in this case. And it may be, uh, I think that we need to really make sure that that's the case before it's approving. Would, yeah. If, if, if I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian. I was going to say I agree, and I would also uh, think that if um, another expert uh, looks at it and says. It needs to be removed immediately, no matter how beautiful and and you know lush it looks today. I would think for public safety, it, it would have to go. So it sounds like that's a clear recommendation from the commission to just take this next month to circulate the report um, to see about the possibility of getting another opinion to give our stakeholders a chance, and we'll put this on the agenda for next month. Great. So we'll finalize our tree conversation with the discussion of the other acacia tree at Ocean View Park, which was referenced in that same email. Do we need to make a motion, though, for this, for just the delay, or is, uh, that is that just a recommendation, or do we need to make a formal motion? You can make a formal motion, and, and I think that it's important to detail that you would like another opinion, and that, okay. you would, and so, that way that will take place. Would sure, I would say then I make a motion to delay it a month um, to for the commissioners to get the full report, you know, as soon as possible. It would be nice because we, you know, doesn't have to be just the three days before. Uh, as second opinion from another arborist, and I don't know how that works exactly, but then I'm also wondering if it, Aaron Wing might. Sorry, I keep on saying his name, but the the other consultant would be potentially willing to present. I don't know. If he's, I don't know how possible that is. So that's maybe you can decide, but that's just another potential um, thing we can do to get more information. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. Everyone in favor? <laughs> okay. All right. I it off at the end there. I wasn't sure what I was seconding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a long motion, um, but it was detailed, which was what what, yes. what it should be. Um, then we'll move on to Ocean View Park's acacia tree. Okay, Ocean View Park is also a blackwood acacia. Um, and just, I should have mentioned early, blackwood acacia trees produce a lot of pollen. Mm. They're, they're considered responsible for a lot of hay fever problems that people have. Um, some people are allergic to the tree itself, to the, the, the wood, the bark, the leaves. You get a, a, a skin irritation from it. Um, I've had requests in the previous job to remove a tree because someone was allergic to the tree, which we thought was crazy, but we found out it is true that that happens. Anyway, this tree is um, a five-stem blackwood acacia tree, and it's previously a six or seven-stem tree. It's had a couple stems removed, and there is some decay at the point where um, these stems were removed. It looks as though 
the trees are splitting. The two, four of the remaining five stems have included bark. They're uh, co-dominant stems, which is a indication for a, a place where the tree is liable to split out. Um, that's a, a bad uh, connection. Um, basically, there. This is uh, a neglected tree. It's got some bad uh, unions, and it's situated towering over the the Friendship Building and also over the parking lot, and right at the handicapped parking spot. Um, this picture of the flowers that produce pollen this time of year, they're just starting to flower. There's gonna be a lot of pollen coming out of this tree. So in this picture, you could see a little better, the, the stems on the left are actually in decline, which is indicating there's uh, fungus, which is what Aaron found, that there's uh, fungal decay around the base of the tree. So if we take out the two stems that look really bad, we leave the other stems, we're just opening them up. There's, there's still fungus in the root crown and we're opening them up to more wind and more li likelihood that they would fall over. Um, the blackwood acacias are mostly volunteer trees. Mm -hmm. The one in Memorial Park may have been planted, um, but these trees, they're legumes, they have little uh, bean pod, like seed pods, and they seed and they, they sprout up all over the place. So it's also con considered an invasive tree. So, um, my recommendation is to take this out and we'll replant with uh, more suitable species. Thank you. Do we have any questions of clarifying questions from the commission for John? Do we have any, oh, go Sorry, ahead. Uh, is, that's a power box, the green box there. Is that, is there any interference with the, the tree roots and that or just curiosity? I don't think it. No, I don't think there's any problem okay, with that. It's, going, it's okay. far enough for you. Do we have any public comment about this acacia tree? Okay, I'm gonna bring it back and open it up for a discussion amongst the commission. Is anyone prepared to make a motion or? I move that we approve the application. I second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. That concludes the tree removal portion of our program. And now we'll move on to the final agenda item. Is that okay? Oh. Hmm? Yes, oh, sorry. I have oh, just right. one more um, quick thing to announce. We planted 70 trees in Albany this year so far, and we have okay. a few more locations yes. that are yeah. 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 here and there that we need to put some in. But there's a list of the trees. If you're interested, I could email it to you. But uh, we've uh, okay. got a lot of nice trees and we have a new contractor that's doing the planting. They're doing a really good job, much better than the quality of work that was done last year. So great. I'm happy with that. So Thank you so great. much, John. That's about great. how many of those are replacements and how many are new plantings, would you say? Oh, uh, good question. Uh, probably 10% replacement, maybe 10, 15%, mostly new trees. So. Great. great. Yeah. So the last item on the agenda for this evening is the, a report from the DOG subcommittee with a discussion about um, the survey that they conducted. And so they'll be sharing that and then there'll also be an opportunity to um, take public comment around that. I will say that we may have a number of people that would like to make public comments. We will be using the timer, so we'll just ask folks to um, come up when we get to that portion. And um, just a note, that Todd is actually gonna be running this item of the agenda because I have to slip out in a moment um, or in a few moments. So um, I'll turn it over to Todd to help us close out this last item on the agenda. Okay, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> Shelly, <laughs> actually I was gonna ask, I, I did wanna talk, um, I'll, I'll run through the methodology, the purpose of this study um, and the results, but I did wanna ask Shelly, um, to provide just a quick, like, one-minute background. I just always think it's good to give the history of Section B, why it's even called Section B. Sure. And, yeah. Um, the uh, neutral <laughs> story is that Section B was uh, created, uh, I can tell you the, the year in one second, but it was when a fence went up that divided uh, 
actually went into that section um, along the right field line of Memorial Park. And that was to keep uh, dogs from running into uh, spaces where kids were playing games. We had some encounters where dogs and children um, uh, collided in one way to say it uh, and so we looked into putting in a fence which is pretty typical for a, a ball field to have a right field fence um, as a result of that the space that was created on the other side of the fence which is section, section B uh, was designated as basically a multi-use sports field in its original uh, form and um, because we allow dogs in all parts of our park to be off leash, people started using that section as an area to run their dogs. And it provided a space for people's dogs who may not be able to have recall or need a little bit of a container, a place to run where they weren't just running off into the street. And that's how we came up upon section B. And this, the fence went up in 2011. So there have been a number of meetings since 2011 um, talking about the issues with section B people for Section B, people against Section B, and so it has been going on for that long. And um, the subcommittee was formed, I believe it was back in May, um, to kind of study where should we have a dog park, what are great places, what are the pros and cons of the available spaces, and they have taken, um, taken it from there. Yeah, and so I just want to say in terms of the goal for why we conducted this survey, one is our dog park subcommittee is, is charged with looking at um, the dog facilities in Albany and seeing if there's a need for a dog park. And one of the things to clarify and why I wanted Shelley to introduce that is Section B is not a designated dog park. It is actually a multi-use area that has become a de facto dog park. De people think of it as a dog park, but I just want that to be very clear because um, I think there's some under misunderstanding about that and I think then people can feel like it's, you know, why it doesn't have all the amenities of a dog park and they don't understand that it's, it was never intended to be, it was intended to be a multi-use area. So in terms of um, why we are, why we did do this survey is given that we're interested in exploring the establishment of dog park in Albany, we wanted to And I would clarify, dog parks, potentially. Dog parks. Exactly. Thank you. Yes, because it doesn't have to just be one. But um, a dog park or parks in Albany, we wanted to understand how the closest thing we have to a dog park in Albany is faring, how the neighbors are feeling about it, how the users are experiencing it. And um, so that's why we reached out. And also, um, we recognize that Section B has been very controversial. So we wanted to be comprehensive in our outreach and really understand how the neighbors feel and how the users feel. And you'll see that in our approach to our outreach. Um, but I also want to reiterate that this, the goal of this discussion today is not to decide anything. Um, we're not we're not, we're not hoping to come to some conclusion about what to do with Section B. This is really just informational. And we wanted to provide a time for the public to speak on this issue because it is controversial, apart from our separate um, dog park subcommittee discussion, which we're going to have later in the month. So um, just to give you some ideas of the process, we're obviously presenting this today you will have a chance to weigh in. But again, this is only informational and we're not asking the commission to vote on anything. The next step and part of, I think, our discussion today will be reviewing a general survey that we're gonna put out to the whole community about desires for dog parks in Albany. Um, and that, um, so that hasn't been, that has not been published yet, that has not been released yet, but it will soon be. Um, after that, we're gonna actually hold a public workshop now we have a date, right, Shelley? So we have a date. Yes, May 30th, which is a Thursday at 7 p.m. And it will be published like a regular Parks and Rec agenda, so it will go out through the normal uh, challenge, uh, channels. So it'll be Thursday, May 30th, so another time to weigh in. Um, but this is not going to be about. And so that public workshop will, the intent of that is to talk about the survey, uh, the general survey, and just dog park um, sort of desires in Albany. Um, and then. Then, after that public workshop, we'll bring it back to the commission to have a discussion of the public workshop, the general survey, this survey that we're going to present tonight, um, with hopefully an intention to have a recommendation to council about what we'd like to do with dog parks in Albany. And so then, and then 
so obviously that'll be another point of input for you all. And then finally, the council will be another point of input because we just can, we we don't make decisions here about anything other than trees, really. <laughs> so you have to. So we recommend to the council what we would like to see based on our analysis. Provide them with that analysis, and then they decide. So that's another point of um, input you have. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to the surveys and just um, talk about the two surveys um, we did. This first one I'll talk about is the general user survey. So this happened in November 2018. Um, what and also does any uh, anyway? So this is a map, and if you see. You all, I'm assuming if you're here to make comment, you know where section B is, but just to clarify, that's where, um, that's the location of section B in Memorial, in Memorial Park. So um, over the course of nine days, um, commissioners Abbott, Martin, and myself um, administered the surveys. Um, over the nine days, it included two weekends, weekdays and weekends. Um, we visited in the morning, noon, afternoon, e and evening hours because we've heard that there's different groups that come to use the area at those different times. We um, brought clipboards and paper surveys and distributed them and collected them. So it was, there wasn't any concern about du duplicate surveys or, you know. Um, I think we did, we did though, offer an online um, survey at a Memorial Park somewhere, but we really, like, we only got two responses. So <laughs> for the most part, all of these were the paper surveys that we, um, we oversaw. We, through that extensive outreach effort, we collected 100, 107 survey responses. And I'm just going to go over a few. You may have all seen this report already, so I'm just going to go over a few of those um, first questions. So one of the questions here, and so Todd, do you want to jump in about what our goal was in terms of these survey? I think we were just trying to, again, get a sense of how users are experiencing Section B. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. Well, but I would just say that, that uh, the goal of this subcommittee has always been to identify opportunities for, you know, an official dog park. Uh, in, in Albany, it wasn't to review and reconsider Section B. It really was using Section B as an example of a currently basically de facto, de facto functioning dog park. So how are people using it? What are they looking for? So if we were to form a dog park somewhere, you know, what would we need to look for uh, as far as that was concerned? Also, what's working well with it now and what's not working well with it now? So, so really the, the focus was we're, we're using Section B as an example, but the focus was really outside of Section B. So one of the questions we had here, you know, a lot of the people we talked to were obviously heavy users of the park or more than once a week. Um, but one of the questions I think that came up was like, who, who is using Section B? And so we asked that in a couple different ways. One was, how far do you travel to Section B? Um, or how, uh, yeah, how long does it take you basically? Or how far away do you live from Section B? So most live just within a few blocks um, or a mile away or within a mile away. Go to the next question, Shelley. How do you get to Section B? This is also another indicator. Um, the walk was 45%, but if you look at the drive and walk, which means you know 45 plus 18, those were not duplicative answers. So the drive and walk and walk, you know, f whatever over six, almost 60% have the ability to walk to Section B. Um, but then when you look at the survey respondents, a zip code, so are they Albany residents? Are they Berkeley? Are they El Cerrito? It looks like actually the percentage of Albany residents is smaller than the, uh, than the number who can actually, or proportion, than the, than the people who can walk there. And um, you all probably know, because you, you go there, if you go there, it's bordered right by Berkeley and, and El Cerrito. So people who live in El Cerrito are many people are closer to Section B even than many other Albany residents. So, um, and then these are questions that we just wanted to um, ask to gauge, you know, these are self-reports of, of how respectful Section B users are. And so, you, of course, you need to take that with a grain of salt. But I do think people generally, I think actually what I want to do is skip ahead to the qualitative sort of open-ended questions at the end, because I think this really kind of gets to one of the questions is why do you choose Section B over other 
local dog parks. And what I think was really clear was it was about location and convenience. So over 59 respondents said location and convenience. And so we really have to take that into account when we think about um, locations for dog parks. Um, so again and again, um, community also. I mean, people definitely felt like there was a, a sense of community there. Um, and then interestingly, I think that people felt, people said this many times, that they felt like the people, the people, the owners and the dogs were respectful, more respectful there than in other dog parks. I'm not saying that they're always respectful, but at least compared to other Ohlone, I heard, you know, it was just a nicer group of folks. And then, of course, other things, other elements that make a dog park, like a fenced in and safe. So, um, so those were just, just a sort of sense of how what we, the key takeaways, I think, were that location and convenience, community and, um, and just a, a, a respectful dog owners and, and dogs. If we go to the next survey, so this, this other survey was, um, actually this happened before the, the user survey, the general user survey. So um, in, what was that? September 2018, um, we didn't, ex what we hoped to do was hope to reach as many Section B neighbors as possible. So this was sort of our target area. So we were looking at um, residents who lived close to Section B. I couldn't like draw, I couldn't have the circle really represent exactly <laughs> who we were reaching, but basically all the residents that lived along Thousand Oaks Boulevard between Pomona and San Carlos, all the Carmel Avenue residents that lived between Thousand Oaks and Portland, and then halfway into Carmel, so halfway down into Carmel. Not so. I think we we're before the El Cerrito border. And two, I think, to the border. To the border. To the border. Okay, to the border, which was represented like five or six households right. on each side. Um, the thinking there was yes, they're the closest, they're most impacted, and then also it even kind of aligned with our Brown Act 500 feet radius. For, there's like this Brown Act, you can't vote on something. You have property or something about financial interest if your household is located within 500 feet of a specific thing. So um, that was our thinking there. Um, the way we did that, so it ended up being 43 households that we targeted. We uh, first did a door hanger. Todd very generously um, designed it. So we hung a door hanger on each one of the households saying, hey, we're parking rec commissioners. We're going to come by to administer a survey. And we, I think we sent an email. We included an email address and a survey link. Then we we actually went and knocked on doors. So we knocked on doors over on one weekend, you know, we, we kind of broke up the households so we might have knocked on doors on different weekends. But we did one visit and if we didn't get anybody at the house, we knocked again. And then if we didn't get anybody the second time, we left another door hanger with written notification of how they could fill out the survey online or contact us. With that, we actually got like a 60% response rate, which is really high <laughs> for, for this kind of thing. And what the, this survey was different. This survey had just a few questions, but they were all sort of open-ended for the most part. And so one of the questions was generally just, what do you think about how Section B is utilized? So that could be many different answers. Um, but I we coded them by positive, negative, or neutral. And so I included that detail so that you could understand what might be considered a positive response versus negative versus um, neutral. And I just want to say, you know, when you have these percentages like 19% or 50%, it's among 26 households. So the actual number is pretty small, but it can represent a big proportion. So um, 13 out of 26 were positive. Um, five out of 26 were negative. Eight out of 26 were neutral. And, and you know the report has all the detail. So the second question was, what do you think about Section B as an off-leash dog area? Kind of similar question, but actually different responses. So um, here we had 16 out of 26, 62% positive. Um, five out of 26, 19% negative. Five out of 26, 19% neutral or no comment. And then finally, do you use Section B 
or a dog park with or without a pet. We just thought that would be interesting because we didn't know how many people, if it was really just skewed, and it wasn't. Actually, then they were, even though some people didn't use Section B at all and were neighbors, they, that, that, was, that didn't always correlate with whether or not they approved of, of its usage that way. And then the question about, do you think Section B users are respectful of the rules? Um, I think, let me see if there's anything else to say there. If you, I mean, there's, I think there is the report printed out in the back if you want. Oh, and then I think just categories for, do you have any suggestions about how Section B can work better with the neighborhood? And we really wanted to look at this, again, to inform a potential dog park design and also to see how we could mitigate if there's any you know, real concerns from the neighbors. How could we mitigate some of those concerns? And so um, I heard aesthetics came up, um, amenities for dogs and dog owners, signage and enforcement of rules. And, um, and then this is just sort of open-ended. So this wasn't, there wasn't a specific category. I think those are just some extra comments. Um, so I think that you know, I think maybe we can pause here instead yeah. of jumping just to the general survey. Is there anything you want to say, Todd or Brian? Uh, well, I, I would recommend anybody who's interested to go re read the actual results because uh, in this context, it's hard for us to go through and read every line. Um, and there's some interesting lines, and so I recommend you go and, and do that. It's available online. Um, there's more copies in the back. But other than that, I would open it up for questions, or Brian, did you want to say anything? You helped uh, administer this survey. I was just going to clarify, to find the report, you know, go to the agenda on the website, and it's a link in there. Any questions? You're the only one who's part of yeah, this effort. The <laughs> All right, so with that, I will open it up for public comment. Please uh, let us know who you are and, uh, and make your, your comment. Hi. I move this up. It's a little tall. Uh, my name is Sabine Bergman. Um, this is my first time coming to one of these meetings, so it's really cool to see the survey and all of the work that you do. So thank you so much for taking the time and effort to look into this. Um, four years ago, my husband and I moved into our house, which is about four blocks from this not actually dog park, dog park. Um, and we didn't know anybody in the neighborhood. And it wasn't really until we started taking our dog here that we feel like we found community. Um, and we felt like we were part of the neighborhood. And we met couples and families and parents who bring their kids there that play fetch with the dogs. And um, as someone mentioned here, there's a three o'clock crowd that comes at three o'clock and a five o'clock crowd that comes at five o'clock. And uh, something that really struck me is watching the presentation about creating these parks and public spaces like the bocce ball courts, trying to create welcome and open places where community members come together. It's so cool that we have that, um, even though it wasn't intended as that. So I think it's a really amazing opportunity. And um, I love the location. My husband and I share a car, and I work from home. So being able to walk our dog to a place that's only four blocks away and let him off leash is invaluable to me. And I know that a lot of other people, it's really cool to see in the survey that a lot of other people you know, feel the same way. So um, we love it there. We love the community. We love the feel of it. Um, we would love to see the hours extended. We've noticed a huge difference in our quality of life during the months when it's closed. Um, but we also want to be respectful of, of the neighbors and their concerns. Um, so yeah, and what else? Oh, people bring um, lawn chairs and sit and talk to each other. Their kids play with each other. Um, I know that there's not seating there, and maybe you might be concerned about the structural integrity of the fence, but people actually hang hammocks and hang out there for hours at a time. So it's definitely a place that the community, there are community members who go and they love it, and they spend time there. Um, and we're some of them. So thank you so much. Can I ask you one quick, you said hours yeah. extended. Do you mean um, the calendar or hours in the day, like open later? Oh, or, so <laughs> Yeah, um, we understand the hours in the day that um, you know it, do it doesn't open until later in the morning, and I think that's might be because of noise concerns, and so it is a little inconvenient not being able to bring the dog, but in the mornings, um, but we make it work. But really, just having three months in the winter where 
we don't interact with our neighbors on a consistent basis has been difficult for us and our dogs, so that would be their priority, really. Thank, thank you, I just, clarity, thank you. Uh, thanks for the follow-up. Any other, anybody else like to speak? You're welcome to. I'm Gerhard Brostrom, 1116 Curtis Street. Again, we're uh, with Transition Albany. We're big users of the area. Uh, I'm so delighted to see that you've done this outreach to really find out what people feel about the dog area particularly because we foster many myths among those of, of us who try and surmise what's happening. We've always assumed people were coming from a distance. We always assumed the neighbors were not happy about that. But I think your survey really does address that very nicely for us. Now, we're caught in the middle because we're stakeholders there, and we have sort of official standing that the dog uh, folks don't. In other words, and that's signified quite a bit by our having access to water. And you'll see that many of the things that were discussed up there had to do with the availability of water. And it's no surprise to you, and it's certainly no surprise to us, because we get caught with our, you know, we, we've got a garden. We have to water. I mean, it's vital. So um, we have lockable areas. We have valves on our hose, because on the other side, the dog folks are looking at our water, saying, you know, wait a minute, you know? And this happens on both sides of the building. You know, you, one isn't near the dog walking area, but we also see heavily um, tendencies for people to want to access our, we have a cabinet on the side where you saw the tree, the acacia tree. People will open that. There is a locked area, but it mostly doesn't work. It's sort of broken. And people are insistent that they want to have access to that water. And there'll be a dog bowl out there often. We'll come in, in the middle of a work day, we might say, well, you know, you can't leave our water on like that. The hoses will get messed up. So there's a lot of issues. I've taken too much time on this subject. We want to be involved as these discussions go forward. There's so much that's talked about. And, the, and the, dog, the dog community are the people that I think in the dark the most. And they're looking for us. They look to us for answers. And it, are we going to be here? Why don't we have water? Are they going to kick us out? Did you kick us out? Why are we? So it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we can coexist there. But the, your attention, I think, is very warranted. And I'm glad to see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Additional comments? Somebody else? Please. Sam Freeman, a uh, member of, uh, of Albany. Um, only a few comments. Um, I'm a regular user of the dog park. Um, I have a, a rescue golden. And one of the big draws to the dog park, section B, excuse me, <laughs> section B. It's not a dog right. park. <laughs> section B is the fact that it's fenced in. My rescue golden will chase. There is no other place in the city of Albany that I can take my dog, that I can play with her, that is fenced. I live right by Terrace Park. I can't take her there. It's not fenced. I go to section B with her so she can run and play and enjoy herself and I don't have to worry about her running across the street to chase a squirrel or cat or something else. That's why I go to section B. I would walk to section B. I walk, I would live down on Nielsen across from Marin, on, by Marin. By the time she's done at Section B, she's exhausted. <laughs> I have to drive there. So I take the car. But I would walk there if, if it wasn't so far away. Yeah. But she's exhausted. I have to bring my own water, because there's no water there. I have to stand there, because there's no place to sit. You call it a multi-use area, but it's not really a multi-use area because a multi-use area would have seating, would have water, 
would have shade. It's just an open space. That's all it is. It's not multi-use. It's not wheelchair accessible. Some of you know my wife uses a wheelchair. It's not wheelchair accessible. It turns to, into soup when it rains. It's not maintained. I go out there, there are potholes. Mm -hmm. Someday, some dog or person running after a dog or a child is going to trip, break a leg, and you know what's going to happen after that. I don't have to tell you. It's not maintained. The potholes aren't filled. I, the other day, I had to put a dog pail over a pothole mm -hmm. because I almost tripped into it. Sorry, I'll cut it short. Okay, enough said. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Other comments? Please. Hi, I'm, I'm Brian Young. I'm at 601 Carmel, directly across. And I didn't prepare any, uh, anything tonight, but I feel compelled to speak and just sort of present a different perspective. Um, I like Section B. I'm a user. I have a dog. I enjoy the same social relationships that you do. But living directly across the street, I think I'm probably more aware of some of the, some of the issues. So my position is that you know, I'm tolerant of noise and you know, all of the um, mixed blessings that Section uh, B, B brings. But I have neighbors or a spouse who is far more sensitive, and I feel compelled to speak on their behalf as well. So here's my position. Section B. Um, Personally, I enjoy it. I'm, um, I'm opposed to any additional improvements because it's, it would be a victim of its own success. It's too congested, it's too noisy when, for the immediate neighborhoods, and if we're gonna pick a place for a dog park in, in Albany, we have to look other places to make the improvements that we all need, the water, the access, et cetera. You know, um, so for the commission, by the way, thank you for doing the survey. Um, I participated in that. I read it. It's a, you guys did a good job. Um, let's look elsewhere, especially uh, the park down by Interstate 80. There's plenty of room to build a fence and the amenities that people need. But to make any additional improvements specifically for dogs and their owners in Section B would only um, accentuate an existing problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other speakers, please. Hi. Hi. My name is Leslie Zephyr. I do not live in Albany. Uh, I've been going to this dog park since at least 2011. Um, I found it because my acupuncturist and chiropractor are, are right in the circle, and I would pass it. I have been to dog, I've had dogs all my life. So I've, and I've lived in the Bay Area since 1973. I have lived in the East Bay since 1981. So I've been to almost every dog park over here. And none of them are like B for any number of reasons. And I, ha I have a, 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 an Aussie dog, half Aussie. She will chase anything. And while her recall is fairly good, if there's a squirrel, I don't exist. So there are only certain places I can take her and feel safe. And B is one of those. And it's, it's not only for my dog, Bella. It is, as these two, uh, this young woman, Sabine, said, there is a, a great community there. You can't go to a park literally five days a week, nine months out of the year, and not develop relationships. And, and I've said this numerous times here. For me, parks are for the community. And so in, in my mind, the creation of the community that has come about as a result of 
B is a, is a complete success. It's what you want in a park. You want people talking, you want people getting along, whether it's to take your kids, whether it's to take your dogs, whether it's to take both, whether, I mean, this is a regular thing. It's, it's equivalent to going to the bar at five o'clock when you get off work. You know, there, there are certain groups during the day. I'm, I'm the 1230 group. And it's, it's just a marvelous place. And, and I, believe it or not, I do feel for the neighbors because I know there are some barkers and there's one in every crowd. But if you move this, the dynamic of what happens in that park is going to change. And you're not going to be able to stop it. And, it, and it, it's going to be like the other parks. And, and part of the reason that it's such a jewel is that many people don't know it exists, which, which I know is kind of selfish of me, but it's the truth. So I just, whatever happens, I, I really hope this park doesn't move, even if that means no amenities. Although a bench, especially for older people or, or those um, with disabilities, would be a great thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to speak? Hi, I'm Jill Lodwig, and I live at uh, 1341 Thousand Oaks, so I'm just directly apart, across from the dog park as well. And, I made a few notes to myself to try to say something different than the other six times I've stood up here. <laughs> I think you've heard our stories many times. So uh, I do have a dog, 14-year-old dog. We don't use the dog park anymore because he's too old to be around the other dogs. And um, I uh, concur with everything uh, Brian said. I see him over there in the dog park a lot. And uh, I know his wife is more sensitive to the noise like me. So. Um, uh, as much as I love the dog parks, I really strongly believe that they don't belong 50 feet from people's houses, and it just comes down to that. So I just wanted to say a couple things I haven't said before. One thing I hear a lot in your surveys say, and thank you for the survey, is people love location and convenience, and they love the camaraderie. Uh, location and convenience, um, you know, we talk about f the importance of green space. So is it, is it important to have trees, you know, a grove of trees near your house? Yes, that's important. Do trees make noise? No, they don't make noise. Is it important to have a baseball field, you know, close by so your kids can play baseball or your kids can play soccer? Yes, it's important. Should it be convenient? Yes. Is it noisy? How many complaints have you received from neighbors in the last 20 years about baseball games? about playgrounds, about soccer games. They aren't problems. The only thing that's a problem in Memorial Park is Section B and the noise that comes from the dog park. So the noise is real and I would say as a dog owner, I understand, you know, when I take my dog to the dog park, I'm not taking a wheelbarrow full of flowers. <laughs> you know, there's a real impact that dogs have. And so, yes, it would be really nice to have that convenience and to just be able to go three or four blocks for this great camaraderie, but you bring with you this thing that causes problems for people who live nearby. You know, I don't expect everything to be, you know, three or four blocks from where I live. So I just want to point that out. Um, the other thing is, um, I hope everybody can keep in mind, there was a UC Davis study, which I'm guessing you're aware of about dog parks that was done, I think probably eight or nine years ago. And the conclusion that they came to is that dog parks have no place in closely, you know, houses that are very close by. They shouldn't be situated there. And one of the things that they pointed out is that the noise level dissipates exponentially just a short distance from the park. So that, you know, I'm thinking of a pie chart I saw with 8% who objected, you know, that's the eight houses <laughs> that live right next to the dog park. So your survey goes, you know, maybe two blocks away. Those people aren't bothered by the noise, I can guarantee it. You know, two houses down Carmel away, they're not bothered. So I just wanted to say that I agree we should have a dog park. I think the survey's great. I think the results are great. It doesn't belong 50 feet from people's houses. And the camaraderie can be found in another place within Albany that's not close to houses. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to make a comment at this time?
Attorney Kostanzik, and I live at 522 Carmel, corner of Thousand Oaks, directly across from the gate, the entrance. Totally unplanned. I hadn't planned to say anything, but <laughs> here I am. You are. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, some of my initial concerns, in fact, most of them uh, surrounding the dog park when it first opened, most of those have actually been alleviated. Um, I was afraid there would be parking issues as a senior citizen. I would have to park some distance away to carry my groceries in the house. None of that has happened. And I've reached a rather um, peaceful coexistence with it for the most part. I have found uh, uh, with my neighbors probably my biggest objection is, and this has increased dramatically in recent months, is the amount of noise, mm -hmm. incessant barking. You expect a little woof woof here and there, but just incessant barking without any apparent attempt on the part of the owner to control that. And uh, my other thing is, I like it that it is closed for those several months in the winter time. That gives it somewhat of a chance to regenerate and heal itself. Uh, since that's the view I see right out my living room window, um, especially when people take their dogs there soon after it has rained, it turns into a huge mud puddle. And again, someone mentioned it's not really maintained. And so that just, uh, the problem keeps compounding itself. And there will be a big bear area, that kind of thing. So I think the, the maintenance of it, the unsightliness, if they don't have that period of closure, is a concern of mine, as well as the, um, uh, the um, unwillingness of some owners to control their dogs barking. So that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anybody else like to make a comment at this time? I think you folks all get huge credit for staying through this meeting mm -hmm. to make your comments. We all very much appreciate it. Any uh, questions or discussion at this point? Next steps. Next steps. Well, our, our, our plan now is uh, to, uh, again, under the idea of, of looking for the, the need and possibility for a, an official dog park uh, or parks in, uh, in Albany, uh, we've prepared a more general survey uh, that this one is targeted more towards the actual dog users, where they would be interested and what they're looking for uh, and, and where that would be situated. And that will be going out in the next couple of weeks. We'll send it out. Um, it'll be online. We're not going to, I'm not sure we can do too many more in person. Uh, that was pretty intensive, but uh, we will be doing more online surveying. And then uh, we have an event in the end of May, which is kind of to bring everything all together and, and have, have a real discussion with the community and try to come up with some sort of plan. That will then come to the count, uh, commission and then to the council. I think also we want to, I don't know how we should do this feedback on this survey because, uh, or maybe we just circle, circulate it one more pass amongst our commission because we want to try to get this published pretty soon so that we have at least a few weeks before that public, right. the next meeting in the end of May. So we, we have a few weeks, but it would be nice to Absolutely. No, I, view it and yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should have received a copy of the survey or, or a link to view the survey, is that correct? It's in the packet. It's in the packet for the new survey. The new, okay, okay. Yeah. This is the new survey, I think, right here, right? So, oh, that was that, okay. Yes, it was just at the end of the dog uh, Very good. Packet. One thing, maybe as a question for you, Shelley, is can we have a, can we have a map, a little map sort of diagram attached? I don't know how easy that's going to be just to kind of put stars along, maybe not necessarily this one, but if you scroll up, there's a question about locations and um, sorry, go up a little bit more. Um, yeah, this one. I think it would be helpful just to show what that is. Oh, so just put a marker at the various spots yeah. on a map? Mm -hmm. Sure. OK, great, thanks. Are you seeking feedback from the commissioners on the survey? We want, we are, but I'm not sure we're going to get any. Since I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I did send you comments. I did, I, I, yeah, I did make edits. 
All right, so I'm, at this point, it's just informational, so we're not asking for any action. Um, unless there's any more discussion, we can close this item and let these folks go home. All yeah, right. the only thing I would say is just maybe among our commission that we want to get some we want to finalize this soon. Yeah. So if you have any comments, if you could, we can have a deadline of like yeah. a week or so before we publish it. Uh -huh. okay. If you give me the deadline, then I'll resend it out and I can filter the comments back through. Is that fine? Yeah. You just want to come up with something or? She's a week? What do you a think? A week sounds like. Yep. Great. Okay. That's great. Yeah. And with, I'm sorry, what's that? I've talked Shelley in the past um, about locations, and Shelley and I have had exchanges about going to various locations. Have you, in this survey, I didn't see this survey that you're about to send. This survey that you're about to send out. Have you addressed all the locations that we talked about? Let's look. Is it these are listed? At the very top, I describe okay. each. There's a description. Um, okay, here. In bold. Well, just to be clear, those uh, okay. are frequently Such used be, dog areas, lane, and then there's a the lawn, oh, yeah. Ohlone Greenway, uh, Jules Terrace Park. Ontario. Are those the? Can, can I go back I, down? Go back down. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, stop, stop, stop. Oh. Stop. stop. You guys should explain. Yeah, what Terrace the Park, <laughs> Albany Beach, Albany Bulb, um, and the place under the. Under the freeway? So, so I can say, um, if, if I may, so, so this is just defining locations that are referenced in the survey, but there is an area further down that talks about the place under the, uh, by the freeway. Sorry. Um, on the far side of the train tracks. It's this one, yes. Yeah, there, yeah. Just, Next to train tracks near and under the freeway, the, the very freeway, top item. We talked about that, the, uh, under the bar tracks. Uh-huh. Uh, key route medium, yes. Uh-huh. Back of Ocean Bar. Well, that's now the Bocce. That's now Bocce Ball Court. That's so correct. Could, right. <laughs> there was a discussion for a while. You can take that out. <laughs> um, and the back of Ocean Park View Park near UC Village. Okay, that's the Bocce Park. What about the place that we talked behind Sprouts? Um, because that is UC Village property. I didn't get very far in my questioning. Um, I think that they are, and I'm not totally knowledgeable on this, but there's a whole plan on the UC. Um, they're going to be building some additional housing. And I think that there's an update on those projects coming up. Uh, it's a two by two by two meeting uh, with a city manager. I think. It's Albany city manager or UC village? It's, it's a two by, so it's the superintendent of the schools, the UC village, uh, head of UC village, and then the city manager get together and talk about these issues. And I saw that their construction update is on there because they, that could be a potential site for where they're building housing, but it hasn't been defined. So the, um, Sam and I um, had talked about there is a space behind the Sprouts parking lot, um, which is currently empty and would be a beautiful spot. It's just not, it's not City of Albany's property. So I don't think it should necessarily leave our minds, but there are obviously a bunch of obstacles in that we don't control that property. So I think once we get a little more clarity from UC on what their next plans are for the next wave of housing, then we'll know a little bit more. Yeah. 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 I got that email about the two by two by two meeting this morning and it says, uh, it's just like post the agenda. It says it'll be April 15th is the meeting where the city and UC Village and the schools get together. And one of the items is update on UC Village student housing development plans. That doesn't mean there's an answer about no, us putting no, a dog park there, but at least no. we'll start to learn more of their plans for their spaces. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. My, Thank you for asking. Thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate it. My only interest is, again, given where I live, given where I live was fairly central yeah. to Albany, is having a, a place that's central mm -hmm. to the community of Albany. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Okay. As, as an Albany resident. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. And I, I did pass along your beautiful spreadsheet to the subcommittee as well for rating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so closing that item, uh, any future agenda items, folks? 
I was very interested in the comment about the wedding agent killing all the fish in the creek. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, is there any role for this body in, in slapping some wrists or? <laughs> um, no, thank you for asking, I, it, not to discuss the item, but I, what I can tell you is that um, the letter went to um, environmental so Claire and our PIO, and she's been in contact with Berkeley, running through their PIO, and I believe that they had a meeting this afternoon, so we'll get more of an update on I, that. I wonder, would we be interested in an agenda item that, in mention, that talked about the, the creek maintenance? Because um, I really don't know what we do and how often we do it. And It'll be coming. It, it's in the work plan, so that- it is, it is in the work yeah, plan. Yeah, and that is that. not something we work on. It's something that'll come I'll through here. Okay, yeah. okay, very yeah. good. Yeah because they have developed a maintenance plan, but it is on our work plan that there's an annual presentation of that to us. Okay, very yeah. good. Good idea then, isn't it? <laughs> Great idea. Any other suggestions? Sounds like hopefully we'll have the uh, Memorial Park tree um, come back. Yeah. And uh, get out all of the information and hopefully get the other opinion. And that's very all good. I, I think we are adjourned. Thanks Thank you. Everybody. Thanks. Thanks.